Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, on behalf of the acting director of the Earth Observation Program at the European Space Agency, Mr. Tony Tolkien Nielsen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you for this Earth Observation Info Days 2021. My name is Maurice Borjo and I'm the head of the department dealing with all aspects related to science, application and climate in the ESA Earth Observation Program. The main goal of these info days are to present the opportunities for European entities to participate in the activities of the Block 4 of Future EO, GDA for Global Development Assistance, but also INCUBED, in short for investing and in, in industrial innovation. Of course, this meeting should have taken physically place at ESRIN, but due to COVID, due to the COVID situation, we are hosting it online. This has definitely not discouraged you to join us as there are more than 500 registered participants for this meeting and more than 440 bilateral meetings, the so-called uh, B2B or business to business, will be organized starting tomorrow for three days. Um, I say we have been extremely surprised here or positively surprised in terms of bilateral meetings. It's really a new record for a meeting online here like, like this. However, today we'll start with ESA presentation of the three programs, this morning reserved for the Block 4 Future EO1 and this afternoon for GDA and INCUBED. The presentation will be made directly by my ESA colleagues responsible for these different parts uh, of these activities. Today, during the presentations, we'll talk about the work plan 2021 for these activities, which have been approved by our member states last November in the domains of science, application, enterprise, federated collaborative platforms, AI for AO, but also the open call mechanism, which allows you to propose ideas or new ideas to us. Please do take advantage of this opportunity to discuss with my ESA colleagues for you to join these activities of these different programs. As you know, the mandate of ESA is to provide for cooperation among European space in space research and technology and their space applications. Definitely space application is the motto for this EO Info Days from research to pre-commercial activities via development of new application using the latest ICT technologies such as, as such as platform. Keeping in mind, of course, that this value of these R&D activities ensures the final leg to deliver EO information to society and are preparing for the support to new EU policies such as the European Green Deal. But we'll talk also about applications such as EO for sustainable development in the frame of the GDA program and support to disruptive EO innovation fostered by the INCUBED program here. At this time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me stop here my introduction and let me thank you not only for your attention, but for also for being with us today. I can only wish you a successful and productive meeting and I pass now the floor or the screen uh, to Evely Desnos, head of the data application division in my department, who will describe the objectives and the contents of Block 4 in the OEP5 and Future EO 1 programs. Please, Yves Louis. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I hope you hear me well. Um, here's the title of the presentation you just announced. It's about the uh, EO for Society in both EO EP5 and Future EO 1 Block 4. I'm Yves Desnos, leading the Data Application Division, and we are going to present with all the colleagues here uh, the various uh, opportunities we offer through the source program. So we have the, here is the overview of the program. Um, we will present the elements of the work plan dealing with, uh, means we have 30 minutes on science, 30 minutes on application, uh, 30 minutes on enterprise, federated collaborative platform, AI for AO, uh, the opportunities to submit proposal at any time via the open call, and then a, a question and answer session. For the question and answer session, you are welcome to use the chat. So please use the chat. We will collect all the questions. For those we cannot answer uh, within this time slot, we will really uh, try to answer them offline and, and, and publish them on the EO for Society website. In the afternoon, we, you will have two presentations, one on global development assistance, and one on the incubed, uh, and then we will close the meeting at three. 
in terms of the participants, uh, we've got participants from 36 countries. Here you can see the various uh, people uh, and their country of origin. Uh, we have also uh, made a small heat map to see that we have participants, of course, all over Europe, but also uh, all over the world. In terms of the B2B distribution, uh, here is the, uh, the appointments we, which have been requested. So they cover, of course, all the domains which are presented. So it's typically uh, one force on application, one force on, uh, on industry. And the rest is split between uh, overall block four activities and uh, platform and science. So for the B2B uh, meetings, you are kindly requested to confirm uh, uh, within today at six o'clock for those who have pre-booked the meeting. And please uh, do that. And this will ensure that uh, all available slots uh, are being used. So we will, uh, in case you do not confirm, we will reallocate your slot to, to people in, in the waiting list. Now, the context of Earth observation. Uh, of course, the uh, ISIO vision is uh, uh, taking the pulse of our planet. This is a nice chart because it's also illustrating some of the uh, as the product stemming for the activity of block four. Uh, so these are a number of geophysical parameters which are, are, are displayed all over the planet. So in terms of the um, missions developed at ESA, I think you, you, you know this uh, uh, very well. Uh, we have um, 16 satellites in operation, 37 under development, 15 under preparation. And you find here the various uh, lines of uh, mission. Uh, the science line, uh, which is uh, basically the Earth Explorer line, uh, the Copernicus uh, missions, uh, including what you see now, the uh, uh, HPCM, a high priority candidate mission, and the Sentinel Next Generation. You have, of course, the, uh, the meteorology line, which is developed uh, by ESA and operated uh, by UMEDSAT. So in terms of uh, where the, the program uh, we're talking about is positioned, this is uh, what we call the trunk of the tree. It's dealing with uh, research and innovation. And of course, it's, um, it's at the root and it's the uh, most important component if you want to have a, a scientific mission, which we call a customized uh, mission or Earth Explorer, and also operational mission later on. Uh, just recalling as a, an illustration of this is the fact that this um, uh, this team is uh, at the root of the uh, of the GMS service element, which uh, really gave birth to to the program called uh, Copernicus later on. In terms of the, the teams you are going to meet uh, today and the next days, here is uh, uh, our, our team. Uh, it's the data application division. Uh, we have uh, several components uh, dealing with science uh, application. Uh, enterprise and digital platform, and you have the name of the person which are going to speak after me, and which will have opportunity to, to talk to. Okay, in terms of um, what we do, uh, our mission is of course to, uh, to uh, foster the data exploitation of the, the mission, uh, in terms of advancing earth science and the science, seeing the science and, uh, as a system, a pioneer new application, uh, and including really develop with user engagement, I would say, and also a, a use collaborative platform. Uh, in terms of the science, section by section for the science section is of course to maximize the scientific impact of the mission. This team is also in charge of uh, AO education and training activity. For the application section, we have to uh, pioneer new application and engage new users. For the enterprise section, of course, we want to stimulate the competitive downstream industry to foster the use of uh, Earth observation data. Uh, the digital platform is important. It's a key component of everything we are doing today uh, with the use of a platform ecosystem and really making use of the latest ICT innovation. Uh, we are all involved also in the what we call the regional initiative, working with the user locally in the region. Uh, looking at so also supporting some international cooperation initiative, uh, managing the EO for Society Open Call, uh, training and education activity. And of course, we are also supporting some of the programs that will be uh, presented today, uh, actually, uh, like a GDN Cube, but also the climate change program. Uh, how we work, um, we are here in this uh, 
circle, we are consulting the, uh, the community and we have continued to do that even during the COVID time. Uh, we gather the recommendation, we prepare an annual work plan, which is submitted to a member state for approval. And we are in, in between this, uh, in this phase between uh, uh, PBO approval and invitation to tender with this uh, info day to try to uh, uh, attract you and encourage you to submit uh, bids to, to our tenders. So in terms of the, um, the program itself, uh, I think I, I starting from uh, EOEP5, uh, the objective of the program are really aligned with the objective of the, of the team, of course. Uh, we foster scientific excellence, we pioneer application, we stimulate the downstream sector, and we support international response to global challenge. We, we really uh, work uh, with the user community, so they, uh, all the activities shall respond to real needs of those users. Uh, we are really in, in close coordination with uh, programs at uh, national level or European programs. And of course, we, we leverage on the latest ICT and uh, really which allows to scale up what, what everything we are doing. So you will find here the, uh, the components in a graphic way and the role of the platform in all this ecosystem of activities. And 10% uh, of the overall uh, budget available is uh, available is uh, made available through the open call. So the uh, innovation is coming from you, industry, and we are happy to, to, to start activities with this mechanism. In terms of the uh, future EO objective, of course, uh, uh, we want to um, extend now today the uh, world leading ex uh, expertise we have in Earth's ob ob observation. We want to address uh, societal needs and global challenges. We want to, uh, to involve the users, of course, and uh, respond to their needs. Uh, we have still this uh, even more uh, complementary cross-fertilizing activity with ESA member states and other European programs. And we leverage now today on the so-called Space 4.0 drivers, such as new space, AI, uh, big data, and citizen science. So you have the um, ele innovation elements which have been added uh, under the future EO program, uh, whether it's a grand science challenge, which will be presented next in close collaboration with RTD, uh, EO, EO for Africa, the regional initiative, which is a consolidation of phase of what was done uh, uh, before, uh, AI for EO, uh, EO for resilient society and security application. And we will continue, of course, to to, to build on the uh, technology of the platform and, and the open call is continuing in the future. In terms of the um, highlights, uh, of course, this uh, info day are one of the highlights of uh, 2021. Uh, we have been also uh, leading the organization of the uh, fee week, which was extremely well attended uh, last year. Uh, we saw colleagues from, uh, from the fee lab. Uh, we have organized a number of um, uh, online science consultation regarding polar uh, water cycle science. Uh, in terms of uh, user consultation, uh, we have uh, continued to, to work with the user community, uh, whether it's on, um, we organize a meeting on health resilience just as the start uh, of the pandemic. Uh, the World Cover Midterm Review has gathered 500 participants just for a midterm review. This is really exceptional. Uh, EO for Agriculture, uh, we had 400 participants. Uh, we had uh, in January a coastal erosion webinar involving the users of, uh, in uh, more than eight countries in Europe uh, looking at this particular uh, application of Earth observation. And lately we had uh, uh, a dedicated workshop with the uh, European Association of Remote Sensing Company with uh, over 100 companies uh, uh, participating to the meeting. In terms, we are also capable with the technology we have to engage the public. Uh, we just launched uh, on the 1st of March, the race dashboard uh, challenge number one uh, in coordination with the European Commission, which allows uh, people to, to, to work with the data and deliver information for, for society. Uh, we have our own uh, outreach channel, of course, the Twitter, Open Science, and of course, our uh, our main page for, for the program, which is called uh, eoforsociety.eza.int. In terms of um, fostering innovation, 
I, I mentioned already the open call. Uh, the open call is about 110 innovation uh, contracts. Uh, we had the first visit presentation at Program Board. Uh, this is a program where we have a very low, uh, strong share of uh, SMEs and startups uh, submitting new and uh, IDs, and uh, which uh, are funded for uh, one year and 150k. Uh, the call is now open under Futuri One, uh, and we had the, the first call uh, or the first deadline in December, and the upcoming deadlines uh, are are in, in uh, are coming this year and are noted on the side March. July and November. Uh, the network of resource approach has been deployed. We, we are sponsoring 70 projects uh, with this mechanism. Uh, we developed in Europe uh, a data cube. It's called the Euro Data Cube. Uh, the number are just striking. Look at the number of monthly visitors, the number of uh, requests per month. And this is a technology which allows us, of course, to, to develop a number of context, uh, contests with the public. Uh, we have integrated solution developed by, by citizens in, 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 through this contest. Uh, we have launched the Open Earth Engine, and uh, I'm happy to announce that uh, we will prepare a, a, a summit uh, next year at the opportunity of the next uh, Living Planet Symposium. Uh, we have engaged new space company, uh, the list of some of them, and we have successfully launched this uh, rapid action on coronavirus and EO. Uh, in a record time, uh, less than two months, uh, with European industry in coordination with uh, European entities. So this is the uh, overview of the uh, the dashboard as one example of integrating all this capability. Uh, this this dashboard is, was developed uh, uh, with scientists, with uh, value adding companies, uh, with in partnership with a number of institutions and. Uh, in Europe, and we have been capable to, to propose uh, uh, 195 economic indicators to date, uh, 28 agriculture, uh, 244 in environment uh, involving 32 companies. So it's a single source of uh, information. It's made in Europe, it's uh, informative and easy to use, and it's using mainly data from Copernicus Sentinel and also a third party mission. Actually, uh, I'm happy to announce that we have won the ISA team award for, for this uh, development, which is of course continuing. We are, of course, um, fostering cooperation. It's one of the objectives of the program. We have a, a large number of uh, bilateral activity for Block 4, uh, which have been held or which are in preparation. Uh, we have a specific coordination body to discuss really the, uh, uh, the evolution of the uh, exploitation on the thematic exploitation platform in particular, but other topics. And we have a lot of coordination mechanism with the European Commission. Uh, I could mention the, uh, we had a high level meeting last week with uh, around the collaboration with RTD on the Joint Air System Science Initiative. Uh, we have a bi weekly coordination on, on, on the rapid action on COVID and AO with DigiDefis. Uh, we are preparing through this program. Uh, what we call digital twin earth precursor. And of course, they, and we are part of the uh, uh, ESA activity with DigiConnect in, in this context. Uh, we have the EO Africa, which is coordinated with uh, GRC. And we have send for CAP, send for STAP, uh, uh, coordinated with uh, DigiAgri. So we have, uh, as I mentioned already, this continuous dialogue with us. It's very important, uh, participating to their board meeting and discussing on the uh, uh, new Sentinel exploitation program. And uh, we have also a number of uh, international cooperation activity, which uh, you all know, uh, regarding collaboration with the UN, uh, CEOS, uh, GEO, GFY. And uh, last but not least, the, um, we have been uh, capable to expand the technology, European technology we are using on the dashboard to collaboration with NASA and JAXA under this uh, dashboard initiative. So last but not least, um, here is the uh, links to, uh, to our website. And uh, that concludes uh, my talk. Hello, good morning. So let's try to um, go very fast to the... Um... Okay. I will present now the scientific exploitation component. And 
the scientific exploitation component uh, is trying to obviously push the uh, frontiers of science, but especially try to maximize the scientific impact of all the different missions that we have. That covers the Earth explorers, the Sentinels, the Meteor missions, but also the national missions and also more and more the missions coming from commercial operators. So we do several things to do that. We uh, engage uh, continuously in a dialogue with the community, uh, but mainly most of the budget goes to develop new methods, uh, new products, and to undertake uh, scientific initiatives to try to address uh, major gaps in our system science. We support also that activities with some uh, efforts to have uh, campaigns to collect in situ data around the world and also a series of other activities supporting training and education. We dedicate also a lot of efforts to uh, develop uh, toolboxes uh, and uh, open science uh, virtual labs for scientists. But more and more, we have more uh, networking and collaborative actions, and I will talk to you later uh, about that. So we are trying to organize the program around what we do we call uh, clusters, science clusters. For the time being, we have launched four of them, on polar research, uh, oceans, uh, carbon, and atmosphere. And the logic is by in the coming two, day, uh, two years, we could also launch clusters in the areas of biodiversity, streams, natural disasters, water cycle and agriculture, and solid earth and magnetic earth. The logic of those clusters is uh, to put together a critical mass of different projects trying to address uh, major overarching goals, but uh, try to develop novel observations and trying to contribute to have enhanced observation systems in those domains. Try to use that novel observations to uh, enhance the knowledge of the Earth system. And finally, try to use that capability and new knowledge in order to advance towards new solutions for society. Right? So this is, in practical terms, the three elements of the, of the clusters. This is an example of what we are doing in the context of polar research. All of these different names are projects. All these projects are trying to address a different component of uh, the Arctic system, the Antarctic system, or even the, the, the third pole, so uh, glaciers around the globe. A similar approach for carbon, for instance. So we have several projects that reflect different components of the carbon cycle, on the land domain, on the, on the atmospheric domain, on the ocean domain. So through the activities of the cluster, we are trying to address gaps that still exist in terms of observation, in terms of knowledge, but also trying to make all these projects working together to exploit synergies and try to ensure that they maybe they, they, the final result is bigger than the sum of the parts. So to do that, we will open this year a number of what we call uh, research opportunities and networking opportunities in the domains of atmosphere, ocean and carbon. And uh, last year, we have for the polar uh, domain already one call. And these calls are mainly uh, inviting scientists to uh, submit uh, ideas for collaborative research across activities, not only these activities, but also beyond, also activities funded by member states, activities funded by the Commission, and to try some uh, community and networking actions, and maybe also uh, activities dedicated to cover some of the gaps that we are not covering so far in the cluster. So we have these three ITTs in preparation for 2021. And uh, another aspect that we are trying to promote uh, around the clusters is to facilitate the access to all the results. So as you could see from the previous slides, we have several projects. All of them are resulting in very interesting results, sometimes new data sets, new products. So we will uh, build uh, this year uh, a catalog. This catalog will allow the access to all these experimental products and also access to maybe uh, reports, uh, papers, uh, open software, etc., to facilitate the, the reusability and to facilitate what we call trying to use a, a more open science approach in the activities that we are running.
So let's have a look now to the ITTs that we have in preparation concerning the new methods and products. So CSAR will be dedicated to develop uh, new capabilities, new algorithms, new methods to better characterize C state information from Sentinel-1, in particular using the wave mode, but especially the top mode. So this will be done also in synergy with Sentinel-2 for products like wave, winds, and currents, and a special focus on the marginal uh, sea ice in the coastal areas and on the Mediterranean region. SMOS 10 VOD, I'm sad, uh, exploiting the 10 years of SMOS data, especially for vegetation optical depth information, and especially to look at the links between biomass and vegetation water content that this type of uh, product is allowing right now. Two activities dedicated to the atmosphere. The first one is Atmos Research Opportunities. This is a direct response to the recommendations that we got in the Atmos Conference 2019. And will uh, include a set of research opportunities, including uh, activities in the area of air quality and ocean recovery. Finally, Eolus Plus uh, on uh, aerosols and uh, processes will be a number of activities to try to have uh, Eolus data incorporated into a multi-product, a multi-mission product um, dedicated to aerosols. And also uh, studies on how the new data from Eolus, the good data that we are getting from the mission on uh, uh, air uh, wind profiles, could be used to better understand uh, processes uh, around the globe. So an important uh, area of the activities that we are running is in collaboration with the European Commission is something that is called the ECE SAR System Science Initiative. Um, we have signed uh, an agreement uh, last year in January with the uh, ultimate target to jointly advance our system science and its contribution to the global challenges that society is facing in the onset of this century. So this is the, the main goal. But this is implemented through a set of collaborative activities, activities on the ESA side, activities on the, on the uh, European Commission side. And uh, we are addressing in particular uh, the major challenges uh, in science associated to uh, the Green Deal, for instance. And the main principle of the initiative, the main principle of the collaboration is based on the try to maximize the capacity of the huge uh, synergistic potential that the European Earth Observation System is offering. Okay. This includes the Earth Explorers, uh, the Sentinels, the Meteorological Missions, but also national missions and more and more missions coming from private operators. So to exploit all that capacity and the synergies that all that capacity offer, uh, air observation is uh, still not, uh, not sufficient. You need to do that together with in situ data. You need to do that together with uh, better models or enhanced predictions. You need to incorporate interdisciplinary research. You need uh, new technologies, and the only way to do that is through an institutional collaboration. So we are trying to align and coordinate activities between the uh, future EU program of ESA and Horizon Europe of the European Commission. Good works in practice, we have started a number of flagship actions. This has been launched already last year, so those that are familiar with our program already have seen some ITTs last year. Those cover areas like biodiversity, polar regions, social health, and natural disasters, where we are also working on the future, and we will have opportunities also in other domains like water resources, food systems, terrestrial carbon, and air quality and health and others. So this is more or less the panorama of topics that we are addressing. These are the flagship actions that we are preparing with our colleagues in Brussels, and that will be translated into a number of uh, ITTs. So uh, polar regions is one of the areas where the collaboration is more advanced. We had already one call last year. And this year we are also uh, trying to uh, respond to this community and in particular to the recommendations that we got in the European Polar Science Week. 
This was a large event that we organized together with the European Commission. During one week, we have addressed different elements of uh, polar research. We have collected a lot of recommendations from the community, and this is uh, what we are preparing for this year. We are trying to address some of those recommendations. So we're preparing a project in the order of one million and a half, two million, to address things like uh, sea ice center comparison, to address things like glacier mass balance, to address the scientific needs associated to the ASA, NASA, Arctic methane and permafrost challenges, and other challenges like Arctic freshwater fluxes, etc. So there are the topics uh, that we have on the table right now, and the ITT is expected to be out in the Q2 of uh, 2021. Another important uh, domain, what we are working with our colleagues in the Commission is uh, sea level and coastal hazards. This will be also a direct uh, contribution to the Raisu Europe mission on climate adaptation. It's uh, dealing with climate disruptions, and uh, you would recognize this probably. This is one of the results of our colleagues of CCI. It's a remarkable scientific result telling us what is the uh, growing uh, in the, the, the acceleration of the of the global sea level, but this information doesn't give us uh, inputs about the causes or about the impacts on, on people. So the thing that we are trying to do is to solve the science problem behind that particular curve. So uh, that is very complex, that requires to connect uh, different processes, social processes, atmosphere, uh, land processes. And this is uh, the scope of this ITT. What, what we are trying to do is to uh, try to give an answer to the people that is dealing with these disasters with the best science that we can. So this uh, ITT will be out very soon, a few weeks from now and it will be of 1 million euro. And this allow us to explain very well what we are trying to do. So we have a big societal challenge, coastal hazards, uh, sea level and coastal hazards. This is associated to a major scientific challenge that requires intervention of first observation data, models, etc. And this is precisely what we want to do. We want to put together the best in situ data, the best satellite capabilities, the best models, and trying to solve this complex science process to try to prototype novel solutions that may uh, later on be applicable to people's lives. So this is coming in the, in the coming uh, few weeks. A similar approach will be followed for climate adaptation and natural disasters. This is another ITT that we plan in Q2. It's another billion. And in particular here, we will look for uh, hydroclimatic streams but especially uh, understanding the connections of multi assets and compound events and their impacts on society and ecosystems. Okay, so this is another one that we are preparing. And finally, another on ocean health. And in particular, this one is trying to develop a number of science cases, maybe focusing on uh, issues like uh, marine ecosystems, connectivity, ocean heat waves acidification, ocean desert, so a number of uh, processes that are affecting ocean health and ecosystems. We are trying to connect that with the activities that our colleagues of the European Commission have launched recently, in particular linked to the development of uh, digital twin of the ocean. Uh, uh, in the last few weeks, probably, uh, if you are involved in ocean activities, uh, you know we have organized a uh, consultation session on uh, how a digital twin of the ocean could be. And recently the Commission has launched in the Green Deal call a uh, dedicated element to develop uh, what could be a prototype of a digital twin of the ocean. So through the activities that ESA is also uh, launching this year, so, okay, on the Atlantic, on the Mediterranean, and this call of the ocean health, we are trying to complement that, uh, and the, the, the next stage is to try to make all these projects working together to develop a solid scientific basis to build this uh, digital twin of the ocean in the future. So on biodiversity, we had uh, launched last year a call, and this year we will try to develop one of these virtual labs. The idea of the virtual labs is to 
support research, support scientists to find an environment where they can find all the data that they need to do research and to share that research with others. So this virtual lab will be funded with 700K in the first stage. And the logic is to support uh, building on the capacity that already exists, so building on the platform capability to develop um, a system that has the data, that has in situ data, that have dedicated tools to support collaborative research in the context of uh, biodiversity. So we have other priorities uh, so for the future, and uh, we are preparing a number of both related to that. So we will have uh, later in the year activities on uh, agriculture under pressure, water cycle research, also, we will have activities focused on geoasserts, especially connected solid earth and surface dynamics, and a number of more feasibility and exploratory activities on how science and earth system science can support other topics associated to the Green Deal, in particular, maybe uh, air quality and health. So this is what we are preparing for, for this year in this context. And just to finalize, I would like to, to tell you uh, a couple of things. Um, as you know, we are very engaged in developing toolboxes for the scientific community. Um, we uh, have uh, one of the main uh, toolboxes that we have that is, uh, has a great success, is a SNAP. So this year we have passed already more than 700,000 downloads. It's time to upgrade the system. So we are preparing an ITT of 1.6 million euro by the end of the year to uh, to dedicate uh, uh, important effort to upgrade the SNAP. That means uh, addressing the technology to make it faster, to make it more compatible with cloud computing environments, to make it more easy for the community to develop plugins. So a number of things that will make, I hope, SNAP more useful and more uh, interesting for the scientific community. We will have another call of the Successful Living Planet Fellowship. Uh, I mean, we are also trying to uh, have uh, a new call uh, by the end of this year with more opportunities also for the candidates to come to ESRIN and to work with us on all these different activities that have been shown to you uh, before. And finally, uh, we will continue the dialogue with scientists and I, uh, I think it's very important that you all participate to these meetings because it's out of these meetings where we get the recommendations from the community that actually are driving our program. So this year we will have a number of those consultations. We will focus on carbon. We will have a consultation on biodiversity, probably also climate adaptation and natural disasters and on ocean health. So. Uh, Finally, a final slide on the regional initiatives. This will be complemented later also by my colleagues. But on the science side, we are preparing a number of calls with focus on the Mediterranean, in particular on land processes, uh, hydrology and, and agriculture. On the ocean, also, right, in the physical oceanography and biochemistry. And on the Baltic and on the Black Sea and the New, we will have another two calls to carry on the activities that we have started already a couple of years ago. So this is what we are preparing. And with that, I would like to stop. And I will pass uh, the, the presentation, I think, to um, Giuseppe, if I'm not wrong. See where the set is. Ava. Okay. You said I think you are presenter now. Thank you, Diego. All right. You should be able to um hear me and see the slides. I'm making them full screen now.
All right. <clears throat> Thank you. So I'm presenting um, the Earth Observation Applications and EO Africa elements of, uh, of the program. The um, primary focus of uh, this uh, group um, is um, indeed on expanding the public uh, sector benefit. Uh, to do that, we maintain a close dialogue with all the key policy stakeholders and uh, those mechanisms that, um, such as, for example, the international policy groups and uh, public uh, conventions and agreements or international initiatives that define the policy drivers that we uh, address. We address the needs of these teams in uh, understanding how um, Earth observation can provide uh, solutions with uh, um, a, a, an ultimate aim at uh, advancing the uptake of Earth observation by uh, these stakeholders and uh, also uh, strengthening the industry that can indeed provide uh, EO-based products and EO-based services to these stakeholders. Uh, as you can see, there is an open dialogue with, uh, so the arrow goes in both directions with these teams. We often participate in the technical committees of these international groups, and uh, we provide advices on how um, global or local, and you know, from global solutions to regional local solutions can indeed respond um, to their objectives. In parallel, we also ensure coordination with those international Earth observation bodies, such as GEO or CEOs, in order to create synergies of resources across uh, the various um, Earth observation international entities. Uh, this creates, um, um, you know, a strengthen uh, in a federated approach uh, the resources that we can bring as uh, ultimate solutions to the um, policy stakeholders. And therefore, this dialogue is really essential and this collaboration is really essential. What do we do? We basically implement projects uh, through uh, industry and academia in order to push uh, the EO innovation and ensure excellence in, uh, in EO research. At the same time, we make sure that we amplify the outcome of our results through the support of cutting edge uh, ICT solutions. And uh, this overall makes sure that uh, the, the results are not only going to uh, a, a small group of stakeholders, but that is um, also amplified across the larger community and eventually also the public at large. This graph was already um, presented by, by my colleagues at the heart of uh, this group. It really is the relation with the end users and the direct involvement of the stakeholders in the projects that we carry out in order really to ensure the appreciation of the value of uh, these earth observation based products and the services and to facilitate eventually the progressive acceptance and the commitment of the integration of such solutions into their practices, what we call mainstreaming of EO. So our really um, push is to bring um, the, these to, first of all, to hear uh, from them the needs through this consultation and, and workshops and uh, capture the uh, user community recommendations and then implement the projects through these ITTs. Of course, these user groups are extremely heterogeneous across many dimensions uh, in, you know, with respect to the graphical geographical distributions, they can span from, as I said, being, uh, you know, local uh, to global uh, entities. Um, with respect to their role, sometimes they have um, um, a role of just a policy definition. Sometimes, you know, after ratification, they have to make sure that uh, certain regulations are applied. And also with, uh, with respect to their objective. So we, um, we have to adapt uh, through different dimensions our, our project and our activities. This was, as I said, it was mentioned by my, my colleagues before me, and indeed what you have heard, we build on synergies. 
So the input and the output that comes from the science project is used as well for us to define um, additional activities. And our consultation and workshops are indeed also triggering science activities or projects in the sustainable initiative that you will hear uh, throughout the day in the afternoon in the GDA presentations. So often, as you um, can imagine, these user consultation workshops are organized together across all our groups to make sure that we capture the different needs at the different levels of maturity of applications or responding to either scientific or applications or mainstreaming of the EO activities. I've mentioned different dimensions. Indeed, we work on uh, different application areas. Here, I'm just presenting, let's say, really broad examples or broad group of these application areas. And uh, a second dimension is, of, of course, the specificity of the objective uh, that each activity has or the product or service that has to be developed. This can span from developing an indicator for sustainable development goals or implementing regional initiatives uh, that also um, have specific applications um, objectives. Responding and implementing uh, projects for uh, resilient society or global activities. And of course, the third dimension goes across the missions. The activities most of the times are multi-mission activities. And of course, with respect to the application areas, we can see, um, let's say, multidisciplinary uh, aspects in which uh, the different uh, the thematics um, are linked to each other. And sometimes we take specific actions in terms of um, uh, readiness of certain specific user groups with respect to one of these missions in preparation of uh, the um, utilization and uptake of future products. So, as you can imagine, the, the flexibility that we have in combining uh, all of these elements across these three dimensions and also their dynamic evolution across time allows the um, implementation of applications that are tailored to the specific needs of each and different stakeholder that we address. Let me then dive into the um, upcoming opportunities and ITTs that uh, we'll be presenting throughout the year. The first three groups, three uh, ITTs are related to the expanding public sector benefit. This first one on the world emission is linked to our world projects. Today, we have already the world ocean circulation ongoing, the world cereal, world cover, world soil, and the world water with the surface uh, water dynamics activity. And in the same approach, we are also implementing the world emission project. This one uh, the, will aim at evaluating emission estimates from satellite observation by specifically using products from the latest uh, SAT technology, allowing um, higher spatial and temporal resolution for the rapid availability of these estimates to users. So we are in, in of course, close collaboration with uh, various uh, um, national authorities and the EEA in establishing this, uh, the needs of this project. And we plan to launch the ITT in Q2 2021. It will span for 24 months and the budget, allocated budget will be 1 million euro. The second uh, project will focus on the pitland observation uh, through um, the uh, Sentinel data. In this specific case, uh, the, the objective is really to prototype an improved mapping and monitoring uh, activity um, of uh, intact and degraded and cultivated peatlands for conservation, management and restoration in the tropics. The uh, planned launch of the ITT is uh, Q2 2021 and uh, we have a year and a half uh, of uh, activity plan for this project with 500k euro. As you can see again, we have engaged dialogue with many user organizations uh, that, uh, as mentioned, go from uh, global entities, international entities, um, with a strong link to certain uh, international conventions, such as the Ramsar One. Of course, in, it's in, um, interlocked strongly with uh, the um, uh, UNFCCC and the Wetlands International Initiative as well. 
We are engaging also dialogue with the Ministry of Environment from Congo and Peru as well to give, again, this global perspective with uh, also maintaining a local implementation of such prototypes. The third entity in this respect is the uh, uh, support to the Global Forest Observation Initiative R&D activities. Um, GFOI is one of the GEO flagships activities together with uh, GEOBON and GEOGLAM. Uh, here, the activity is spun over uh, three years, so it's a longer term type of support that we provide to GFOI to ensure the coordination that is, happens at, uh, with respect to R&D activities. Um, and uh, basically, we want to really make sure that uh, we, we uh, co-lead these efforts and be able to prioritize and catalyze research activities towards the development of operational forest monitoring efforts at a global level. I move on to a, a second block of, uh, let's say, perspective that we have within this group, which is related to the sustainable development goals. These goals, as you may well know, um, were um, stemming from the Millennium Development Goals and they were um, transformed into sustainable development, um, a, into a sustainable development agenda back in September 2015. Uh, there are um, 17 specific goals uh, identified by the UN. And um, they, 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 these goals, you know, target um, really uh, the, the end of poverty, the protection of, of the planet and the assurance of prosperity for all, leaving nobody behind. We carried out in the past um, an exact, let's say, um, assessment of how Earth observation can address uh, these goals and specifically the, the target that uh, these goals have and, uh, and the, the indicators that have been so far identified to respond and to transform more global goals into specific indicators. You've seen here that there are six um, SDGs towards which um, Earth observation can really um, deliver tangible outcomes. Uh, these are listed here. And uh, of course, the, the translation of Earth observation data into product and services uh, with respect to the actual targets and indicators is uh, really heterogeneous and can, can span across different thematics. And uh, we'll, um, we have transformed, let's say, we have captured these needs and um, also into a specific uh, handbook uh, that was recently pu published uh, in a 2018 edition. From that, we have developed many entities, and uh, the we there are let's say some mm, approaches that we have identified. We can develop specific pathfinders activities or uh, scaling up type of activities. Also implementing uh, what we call SDG engines, and, uh, and eventually also what uh, goes back to the engagement with the stakeholders in order to raise awareness and facilitate the uh, full appropriation of such EU-based solution with the various stakeholders. So what are the ITTs that we will be implementing this year? The first one is um, a grouped ITT of 1.5 uh, million that will be issued in uh, Q2 of this year. It will, as you can see, grouped uh, three Pathfinders type of activity and one engine. The Pathfinders will, um, the first one will focus on uh, um, the, the national assessments of land degradation and restoration activities. This um, uh, will be joined with the informal settlement mapping uh, needs. And the third one will be uh, sustainable forest management support. The engine instead uh, will uh, um, will try to let's say integrate your data processing and in and, and data analytics um, on the existing EO exploitation platform. So for uh, seamless integration into national SDGs monitoring systems. So this is uh, let's say a more um, in infrastructure type of activity that will be added into this ITT. And a separate ITT instead will uh, focus on global wetland inventory. 
This is stemming from a partnership with UNEP and um, in response to the Ramsar Convention in order to scale up EO best practices on wetland uh, inventory um, using indeed a, a, a participatory approach and platform-based approach for the whole solution. I move on to uh, um, a different programmatic activity that is handled by the group, and this is EO Africa. Uh, it's um, here I, I've added the recent uh, website that was just uh, launched on on this specific activity. EO Africa is actually an acronym. It stands for EO Africa Framework for Research, Innovation, Communities and Application. It's um, the its objective is is to um, implement and 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 strengthen the African European R and D partnership to to facilitate indeed the sustainable uptake of earth observation data in uh, and and uh, all the related let's say space technology in Africa. So there is a strong um, let's say um, joint effort here that has been established. Uh, with uh, with Africa African entities in order to uh, capture their needs and make sure they we implement um, let's say solution fully responding to their requirements and uh, their their um, uh, challenges. It it is um, built across various level. The first one is really building on strategic partnerships across the. Uh, African Union Commission and also European and international agencies, making sure that there is full ownership by the uh, African national authorities, institution and the private sector, and therefore it's uh, indeed supported by European know-how, European expertise, but with the full um, objective of building capacity and uh, with the um, ultimate ownership of such capacity and um, in, into the African um, environment. And of course, we want to make sure that uh, the results of uh, the ICT um, um, technology is also um, benefiting the, pro the, the, the EO African project, and we leverage on this technology to expand on the results that we will be achieving and uh, uh, eventually we'll be able to facilitate this uh, European Africa, um, um, let's say, collaboration also through the sharing of R&D experience and involving joint type of uh, activities. Uh, the, um, the, the first uh, ITT that was already implemented uh, kick off to last week on the 1st of March. This is a very important research and development facility. The, the, the prime is the University of Twente with the, uh, the Faculty of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation. And through this ITT, there will be other open research calls that will be issued in the coming months. So as you can see, the, the, uh, the overall duration of this project is three years. And throughout this project, there will be um, uh, 750,000 euros that will be allocated for specific R&D activities uh, that uh, will target specific uh, thematics. The second one, uh, ITT, has been just issued last week as well. Here's the link also provided. It's um, uh, addressing continental range monitoring over Africa at 10 meter scales. So it's really pointing at high resolution type of products and services, addressing the uh, African regional livestock management under various different climatic pressure, uh, at, um, let's say, perspectives. The ITT, once kicked off, will be um, of a two-year um, length and the allocated budget for this ITT is 1.2 million euro. The third element is what we call national incubators, um, not to be uh, misunderstood with actual, let's say, commercial incubated activity, but it's more from, let's say, um, new type of uh, um, activities. So the incubation of new activities, a new push for the actual implementation of the adoption of uh, Earth observation uh, products and services. 
This one will be for sustainable agricultural practices and uh, draft monitoring. So it will be very important that uh, the, the, the partners uh, will also be linking Africa uh, partners with European partners to make sure that, as I said, the synergies of um, capacity building will be fully exploited and implemented. The ITT launch is foreseen in Q3 2021. It will last uh, for two years and there will be three of such kind of activities um, be implemented each of 5k uh, euro. So of a less sort of um, um, consolidated in, into a more exploratory element, these are what we call the EU Africa Explorers activities. And uh, again, the very similar, um, let's say, approach, but indeed addressing uh, um, less, less, def less consolidated type of EO um, activities. So really ex testing experimental techniques. Uh, here there is uh, also synergies with uh, new EO data sources, new type of uh, also activities looking ahead for um, either new space or future, uh, future missions of ESA. And um, the, the, um, um, the approach here in terms of procurement is to launch up to three of such ITTs, each of them of 300,000 um, euros, and um, with a flexibility of time between one and two years. Finally, uh, not handled specifically by our department, but through the ground segment department, uh, there will be a 90T for, um, let's say, ground segment infrastructure activities. Uh, this will be a 3.6 million euros. And on top of that, we will try to exploit as well the network of resources, infrastructure, let's say, and setup and strategy in order to support both African and European research institution to use and implement projects uh, through accessing cloud computing resources. So this will be on top of the actual ITT that is presented here. With that, I conclude the presentation and of course there will be all the various bilateral ad hoc meetings for uh, Q&A um, questions and, and, um, and responding to more specific needs and, and uh, information. And I'll, I'll be passing now the presentation rights to um, my colleague, Gordon. Good morning, can you hear me? I can hear you, Gordon, indeed. Okay, I'm now, okay, I've got the presenter mode. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see it. Excellent, thanks. Okay, so good morning, everybody. I'm Gordon Campbell. I'm head of the uh, enterprise section. Uh, so I'd just like to walk through um, the couple of minutes on how we're working and then the uh, the principal uh, tenders that we're uh, opening over the, the next 12 months or so. Um, just our section, we manage the industry growth line under the um, the old um, EOP5, the, em the old envelope program. And under the, the current uh, program started under the last ministerial. Uh, we're running the EO for resilience activity and the regional in initiatives. That's together with um, Giuseppe now. Uh, we're also running a line um, promoting uh, wider use of civilian capabilities uh, among the security community. We call that EO for security. And we're also uh, overall running the permanently open call, although um, that's uh, covering the, the different elements uh, from everybody that you're, you'll, you'll see presenting today. Um, in terms of how we're thinking about uh, these things, uh, I mean, the, the three main uh, areas we're trying to address in the, in the enterprise section is how do we get earth observation out of the you know, preaching to the converted and really embedded into uh, operational activities. Um, we started that under um, the industry group. Uh, At the same time, at, at sort of overall, uh, address blockages. Oh, we have lost your audio. We cannot hear you. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, can you hear now? 
It's okay now. Yeah, sorry about that. Can you um, switch on the video, Gordon? Sorry to disturb us. Switch on the video for the recording, please. Uh, okay. Is that better? No, I switched off. <laughs> Can you see that now? Hello? Not yet. The camera. We just see a black, black screen for you. Now it's okay. come. Okay. Here you are. Thank you, Gordon. Yep. Okay. Uh, um, oh, on. Oh, things are happening on my PowerPoint presentation with that. You can see, you can still see the PowerPoint presentation, yeah? You can see that, yeah? You're now in presenter mode. Yeah, okay, excellent. Yeah, so... Um, so uh, presenter mode, uh, you're not full screen. Now it's good. Okay, sorry for that. Okay, so I say we're addressing blockages to air conservation being accepted as best practice, and I'll go through that in a bit of detail. And lastly, and you know, really uh, looking at the uh, more of the, the you know the innovation, really trying to stimulate new capabilities, new partnerships, and new working methods for organisations working with earth observation, and that spans uh, basically all um, all of the different. Uh, um, uh, all of these different block four lines there. So EO for security, regional initiatives, resilience, also uh, to a certain extent AI for EO. Um, in terms of what we're trying to, uh, sorry, this is going, um, just let me go back here. Um, sorry, this is, um, so high level opportunities we're trying to push really under AI for EO, we're trying to push this, the integration of leading AI capabilities in the, um, the earth observation uh, industry sector in Europe. In terms of uh, with resilience, we're trying to open up new markets uh, for integrating earth observation with other data sets. So things like um, uh, IoT uh, data sets, other um, specialized data sets increasingly uh, being used by uh, target users there, as well as um, uh, modeling capabilities. In terms of regional initiatives, we're trying to connect the Earth observation applications with a wider range of policy domains where there's um, common requirements in particular geographic regions, such as the Baltic, the Alps, uh, the Danube, etc. And in terms of EO for security, we're trying to do four things. We're trying to extend the technical capability of existing systems. So looking at how can we expand existing SAR capabilities, for example, using new SAR algorithms. How do we foster partnerships between companies with complementary capabilities? Uh, how do we verify Earth observation for operational practice, foster spin-offs, et cetera? Uh, let me try and go. Okay, so in terms of uh, actual tenders, um, the, uh, the first line I'll tell you about is uh, the EO for resilience activity. So we, we're basically, um, we have one tender which is open already. That's uh, EO for statistics, and that's looking at how do we uh, connect Earth observation derived information with uh, statistical information for national statistical, statistical offices that are looking at compilation of new statistics they're not routinely collecting right now that link to uh, operational resilience. That, that's open now. Um, in terms of uh, how do we embed Earth observation, we're looking at uh, an ITT uh, to be released in quarter two, building Earth observation into operational resilience. And that's addressing three different domains, uh, public health, uh, urban sustainability, and uh, ecosystem uh, resilience. And what we're trying to do there is develop and verify uh, prototype, uh, prototype uh, EO-derived information products being integrated with, uh, like I say, other other other, um, other data sets that may not even be conventional data sets. So it might be IoT-based sensor networks. It may be uh, data from uh, mobile phone operators. It may be any, any, any of these sorts of data sets, as well as some of the prototype modeling and analytics capabilities characterizing things like... Uh, uh, some of the dynamic aspects of uh, ecosystems or uh, human activity as well. And we're looking at two elements in there. One, resilience against long timescale uh, perturbations, so things like climate change, etc. And also resilience against short timescale shocks, like natural man-made disasters, economic shocks, pandemic uh, disease outbreak, etc. So uh, really looking at um, uh, new domains where earth observation isn't used in, the, in this 
uh, in this context to a large extent right now and really how can we go beyond a static characterization of the situation to uh, a characterization of resilience the plan is to have a single ITT um, with three annexes one for each of these areas and we would start one contract in each domain each of uh, 700k that's how much money we've got in terms of regional initiatives uh, we've got three main uh, activities here uh, in terms of, I mean, what we're trying to do, the regional initiatives, uh, we're addressing, uh, like I say, a number of different regions, so the Atlantic, uh, the Baltic, the Alps, the Danube Black Sea, and the uh, Mediterranean. Um, the first uh, activity we're looking at is addressing the Baltic, the Danube, and the Alps, and we're looking at how do we integrate uh, EO-derived information, again, with uh, non-Earth observation data in the particular region uh, of interest, uh, like all of, all of these uh, different data sets there, plus more. So things like uh, building information management systems, et cetera, um, as well as prototype modeling capabilities to characterize uh, some of the regional level dynamics uh, in areas such as ecosystem human activities as well. Um, so this is, uh, this is being driven by how monitoring and analysis requirements are evolving in each of these regions, the Baltic, the Danube and the Alps. Uh, and also looking at how we can uh, build on uh, advances um, uh, being put in place elsewhere. Uh, so things like improved characterization of uh, some of some of the uh, earth system processes that's being uh, looked at elsewhere. So yeah, again, I mean, we would have, uh, the plan is to have uh, one ITT that we released in quarter three and contracts in place by uh, end of the year, beginning of next year, but three parallel contracts to look at um, aspects of, of this in, in each region uh, and each contract would be 500k. The second activity is looking more at uh, stimulating uh, regionally focused uh, ap application development and the idea is how can we have um, a set of larger contracts in each contract we would have a number of smaller application developments and each of the applications together will constitute a, sort of a critical mass of different information uh, parameters uh, addressing um, yeah, uh, uh, addressing the evolving requirements of, of key users in, in the region. So the environment protection agencies, public health ministries, um, regional um, uh, uh, economic development activities, etc. Um, so the, the regional cooperation frameworks, like things like uh, Helsinki Convention, the Black Sea Convention, and also the, the relevant uh, regional development strategies. Um, these exist already for the Baltic, the Alps, and the Danube Black Sea uh, area. So for each of these uh, regions, the Baltic, the Danube Black Sea, and the Alps, we would look at uh, placing one contract, uh, and each contract would be for a maximum value of 500K, but each of these contracts would consist of um, smaller uh, like I say, a set of smaller uh, application developments, somewhere between uh, 50 to uh, 100k each. Um, the last activity is how do we strengthen the engagement of uh, some of the regional stakeholders with what we're doing, uh, based on conversations we're having with some of the secretariats. They're, uh, they're interested in earth observation. We're not fully matching uh, the priority requirements that they're um, currently looking to address. Uh, so we would look at one contract in each of these regions, the Baltic, the Danube and the Atlantic, addressing the, um, uh, the evolving requirements, uh, particularly in terms of uh, things like uh, ecosystem characterization uh, in, in each of these regions. And that would be addressing HELCOM, uh, Aus OSPARCOM and the, um, the Danube Secretariat. So again, the plan is uh, an ITT uh, to start three parallel contracts, one in each region, and as this is a sort of getting started, um, it's less money, so it's, it's basically uh, each contract would be a maximum value of uh, 250K there. So that's what we're planning for the regional initiatives. Uh, in terms of uh, Earth observation for security, we've got uh, a number of uh, different lines. Some are addressing fundamental uh, technology developments to um, uh, where the uh, resulting capability would be of interest to the security community in its widest possible context and some are how do we embed earth observation into um, uh, into, into better into the operational practices so starting with uh, some of the technical developments um, we have an ITT that will be coming out um, as soon as possible uh, and that's looking at uh, super resolution enhancement of uh, a number of uh, uh, different data sets. The first one will be uh, addressing multispectral and uh, SWIR uh, data, uh, satellite video and hyperspectral. Uh, let me 
click on on the thing. So it's three actions there. Um, so we would start one activity in each of these domains, and each would be uh, 200k. And then later on in the year, um, we're still having a, a bit of discussion about it. We want to have a, a super resolution for uh, geostationary data again of 200k, looking at what we can characterise into around um, uh, equatorial Africa uh, with that. And again, that contract would be uh, 200k. Uh, we have a parallel or, or a, a second activity which is uh, almost ready to go, and this is um, uh, for a number of the um, the small satellite data capabilities that are increasingly available. Um, so uh, systems like ISI, um, but I mean, there's a number of uh, small satellites were launched uh, in the second year. These are now uh, more or less um, uh, all commissioned and uh, providing data on a routine basis. Uh, and a lot of these small satellites are extremely interesting complementary data sets for, uh, secu for security users. Um, so what we want to do is um, basically start three contracts where we would demonstrate the fitness for purpose for these small satellites for uh, different security users. Uh, the idea being, you know, the small satellites, they're a, a bit of an unknown quantity for a lot of these more conservative uh, stakeholders. And we would look at how can you uh, how can you demonstrate things like the uh, reliability of acquisitions when you have to, the reliability of tasking, uh, the reliability of uh, downlink and processing, the quality of the data, uh, the whole end-to-end -end chain and the utility of the derived information uh, complementary to uh, the existing sources of information. So again, we would have one ITT, we want to start three contracts and it should be a maximum value of 500k and that's going to be out um, as soon as uh, we can get it running through the system. The third activity is on SAR capability development. So we're looking at how can we develop some uh, specialized uh, processing capabilities to go beyond uh, existing uh, capabilities. Uh, so in particular, the three we want to look at are um, inverse SAR processing. How can we uh, improve the resolution of uh, some of the targets that would normally be smeared out in normal SAR uh, images? Uh, and we, we use that sort of motion uh, of the target to um, uh, to look at an inverse SAR processing to increase the resolution there. Uh, a bi-static SAR capability, there's um, uh, two, poss two possible data sets of um, uh, X-band SAR uh, we, we expect to be available um, to, uh, to test bi-static uh, capabilities uh, of interest for the, the security community. And the third one is how do we integrate SAR with some of the emerging passive microwave uh, capabilities that are coming along? So that doesn't mean AIS, that means things like the, um, uh, you know, the American version of this is Hawkeye. Uh, there's two or three European uh, systems. And we really, really look at the details of that. So it's not just a derived uh, product like what we would get from Hawkeye, but it's really how do we look at the integration of, of the different data sets to, uh, um, to generate a much more uh, a comprehensive uh, a recognized picture of, of what's going on. Uh, we want to start one or two activities in each of these domains and depending on the domain, the contract value would be two, uh, 250 or a maximum of uh, 400K. More on the um, the integration now. So the first sort of uh, platform-based activity we want to do, which is basically how do we take the difficulty out of using EO-derived information for organisations that are active in the security domain? A lot of them will say, "Yeah, you know, we we you know we like Earth observation, but it's too difficult. It's too complex." Um, if we want to have Earth observation embedded into the intelligence models that a lot of these stakeholders use, it needs to be much easier, and diffusion needs to be uh, straightforward, not. Uh, no, it's not at the end of the chain, if you like. It's it's inherent in all of the steps in constructing a, uh, an intelligence model. So the first domain we want to look at is um, uh, well. Let me click through uh, all of these. The first, the one we want to look at is actually uh, environmental crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, they have similar requirements, so using um, similar, uh, more or less similar uh, uh, data sets and similar processing. Uh, so we think, we, and there's a lot of uh, interaction between some of the stakeholders that are involved there. Um, so we want to look at a, a prototype platform capability to support the investigation of, of uh, uh, these domains, environmental crimes, crimes against humanity, and that would have a maximum value of 1 million euro. And there we're looking, really looking at how do we get prototype earth observation capabilities integrated with uh, other capabilities as well. This is not just earth observation by itself. We really need to be embedding the earth observation in the uh, in the investigative uh, process and the intelligence model. Similarly, two smaller activities of uh, 750k each 
One, looking at how do we support regional security uh, collaboration, um, uh, in particular with respect to counterproliferation, and here counterproliferation refers to chemical, nuclear, and uh, radiological uh, uh, technology proliferation. Uh, and also, how do we characterize, how do we improve the characterization of threats in uh, undergoverned territories? So things like, um, you know, monitoring uh, uh, onset of violence uh, activities, you know, that create threats for Europe, like um, uh, drugs growth, etc. Uh, and again, in both cases, um, this will be prototype Earth observation capabilities integrated with all of the other uh, information sets collected in a uh, and easily. Uh, transferable into the intelligence model that the stakeholders use there. So it's not Earth observation by itself, and we really need a critical mass of uh, capabilities there to be interesting. The last point is, um, uh, at the, um, uh, this is quarter three or quarter four, we want to look at how do we combine um, uh, uh, deep learning and physical models uh, of uh, what features of interest look like uh, to improve feature identification and pattern recognition. Again, primarily with respect to uh, requirements coming from uh, the security community. And we would look, again, uh, two contracts, each of 200K um, com coming out of that, that tender. So I think, I mean, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, different elements in there. Uh, hopefully there's something, um, uh, uh, something for everybody. Uh, two others that we have to do that we're, we should have done in uh, 2020, but um, uh, we, had a, we had a number of delays based on a number of regions. So the first ITT, is an ITT on video analytics. As we, I mean, the, we delayed that because um, there wasn't enough um, SAR, uh, satellite video data. Now that issue is being addressed. And what we want to do is take state-of-the-art AI techniques for uh, motion detection and characterization and look at how can we apply that to um, video uh, or satellite video data. Uh, given, I mean, satellite video is it's video, but it's a uh, you know, it's a different situation from what a lot of these uh, techniques were developed for in the sort of computer vision domain. Um, so the idea is how do we extract the, the movement, characterize it, and how, does, how do we integrate that with uh, other information like uh, the analysis of static imagery to improve the characterization of uh, what's happening? And the idea would be uh, you know, we want to have that ITT out before the summer, and we would start two parallel contracts, each of 200K. And the last thing is a best practice uh, 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 development. This is what we were talking about before. So it's basically how do we elaborate all of the different uh, use cases uh, for using EO derived information in the whole end to end um, uh, industry uh, for Arctic shipping. So that includes things like um, you know vessel design, uh, um, vessel management, route planning, optimized port operations, etc. This is then the basis for how we establish best practice for the use of uh, EO derived information in this sector. Um, there's still uh, a bit of discussion, um, but hopefully if, it is, if, if, we, if we do manage to release it, it will be um, uh, quarter three. And the value of that is 500K. It's similar to uh, some activities we did in the past on best practices, one on mining and extractives and one on um, uh, agro insurance. So that's pretty, that's it from me. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, oops, that's the permanently open call. I'll come back to that uh, later. So that's everything for me. Um, let me uh, try and pass back to, uh, so I can stop sharing. And I'll pass over to Gunter Landgraf now. Oops. Okay, so Gunter, you should be the presenter now. I have the ball, okay. So we are ahead of schedule, incredible. I have never seen this. Must be the magic of the online session, maybe the accelerated graphic cards or something like that. So we'll have no problems to catch your flights. <laughs> um, so federated collaborative platforms, good morning. That's uh, my presentation. 
So what we are doing here, what we are trying to achieve, Can you still see that? We don't see the slides. At least I don't see the slides. Okay. It, it seemed to me that something has happened. Thank you, Diego. So let's reshare them. They are coming, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what are we trying to achieve in the Federated Collaborative Platforms? We are trying to support the European Canadian community in changing, improving the way of doing science and application development, because digital transformation really is just blowing a, a sharp wind in our processes. So, this is how we did things in the past. But, uh, Mission owners had the ground segments, we made the data available, and you downloaded the data to process, process them on your own infrastructure. But what has happened then, the platforms came on, to, on the plan. And let me say, first thing, maybe remember Google Earth Engine was the first and we had Amazon Earth. Uh, you see here some citations, maybe some strong statements, Eric from Eulen, is a digital transformation enabler. He's an expert on uh, platform economy. Strong statement. Uh, you either become a platform or you will be killed by one. Okay, let's hope not. Uh, also interesting, I find Hayden Shaughnessy uh, of the Center of Digital Transformation, University of California. I think that's interesting for us. So the platforms, they restructure the markets horizontally and enable exponential growth. Oh yes, this is what we would like to see in our observation. Um, content is critical to platform development. So this is what we want to provide. And platforms have a culture of restless technical innovation. So I think that is what we, that we, want, we want to foster. So it's an important opportunity. Uh, And I have some problems to go ahead with my presentation. My platform, okay. So this is analysis of Professor Van Eulen. So, I mean, the platform economy really is flying. The sad thing that it is really dominated by US and Chinese. You see the US in blue, the Chinese in red, uh, whereas Europe. And uh, at least in Earth observation, where Europe, if someone asks you, where is Europe still number one? Well, in Earth observation, we are. Uh, we try really to have the European players in the limelight. Um, so again, Professor Vermeulen, this is what he predicts. Um, platform should enable, you see, the exponential growth here where we are. Uh, the main power really that is important will be AI, who will uh, enable an automatic automation process that is, of course, important for the growth. And this is, let's say, the growth curve that we want and try to sustain. Um, so we have uh, seen between the two layers we so saw at the beginning, uh, we can identify two major categories of players. One is the people in the cloud industry, the cloud industry partnering with the people who put the data on the cloud. And you see some players here in the resource tier layer. And we want to leverage that. You remember the big layers investment of the European Commission. Now, on top of that, we really want where the real business, the value adding starts, the platforms helping science and uh, the value adding, the platform services layer, this is where we want to invest. And here we want really that the European players are number one in the world to make this happen. 
Uh, all of this is in Europe, we have a federated solution. We don't have the big giants like in the US. So we invest also in the common architecture and in open interfaces. Uh, and all of this layer in the middle, we call the network of resources. We try to federate this network such that everybody can make best use of that for science and application development and scale it up to, to really the maximum use. We are supporting this with uh, three lines. Um, of course, very traditional, we are evolving the technical capabilities, the platform capabilities that we have, and you will see some ITTs there. This is very traditional, so look out for the ITTs. I will present them in some of the next slides. Uh, common architecture, so to link all of these things together. The European players in OGC are really leading now. We are driving the show. European players, even for the activities that are sponsored by uh, our US uh, partners, uh, it's often European companies who, who win in OGC because really we, we, we brought them to the state of the art. Uh, in the common architecture, I mean, the core team is selected now, but you can still come in with your platform or with your use case. So just propose your use case and we will see how we can engage with you and can bind you in into the common architecture. And finally, the network of resources. So as you see on the right, onboard your operational offer. So if you have an operational offer that you think uh, others can use to do science or applications, bring it to the network and um, we will sponsor your customers for scientific use, actually research use up to pre-commercial uh, demonstration. So if you have uh, an operational offer, uh, bring it and share it with the others. So let's go to the first uh, initiatives that come uh, this year, common architecture. So there is uh, several OGC innovation activities. OGC 17 testbed is, is just finished, so this is now selected. But there will be other pilots, there will be other sprints uh, coming out in best practice. So in Amits, we'll have to look for Telespazi UK. Um, what, what comes out, there will be 100, 200 K per initiative, one year per initiative, or bring your use case. Um, we prefer that you could propose it via your delegation. You see here, there's this, this the, uh, data coordination body architecture working group. Bring your contribution. You can also contact directly Cristiano Lopez. And we spend 50 to 200 K per use case, depends how interesting or wide it is. Um, and here you can learn or modify your application or your platform to make best use of uh, the latest uh, interoperability standards. Network of resources. Um, two activities for this year, resource tier sponsoring. So you remember it's the lower tier, uh, cloud providers with the data readily available for you uh, and you can host your application or your science on these uh, resources. We have a set of pre-qualified providers. Um, if you think you have any infrastructure that you want to make available to other people with uh, relevant data, you can still come in, contact us. The most important thing is in your science application uh, proposals, use these resources you hear you see here the uh, the web url where you can uh, discover what resources is available you can base your proposal on usage of these resources and the network of resources will give you the sponsorship um, so i think you can do more with, with your projects by using the resources we we provide here for free to you for other projects uh, on platform services instead we ask you specifically uh, think of uh, developing and operating your platform. We need a strong European platform offering. Um, there is a permanently call open as a best practice in uh, Claudio. You go to Amit, you go under entities, Claudio, you see it is open. Every month we evaluate the 
uh, the new proposals of who thinks he has uh, services uh, that he can make available for science or application development that others may use. We onboard you and we will sponsor your customers to promote uh, your European Canadian offering uh, to, the to the community. Evolving technical capabilities, of course, there is going on a bit more. First ITT that will come out is probably quality assurance facility. It is about quality assurance, data quality certification services based on AI technology. Ola Grabeck is the technical officer. Will come out probably next quarter, duration one year, 500K. It's about process definition, tool development, and of course, then service provision. This is we insist in this line. Uh, it's not just doing software development. At the end, you should provide a service. Same is true for the near real time platform. This is already ongoing with uh, KSAT, uh, T Systems, uh, Space Tech, and some other partners. But we will extend this, onboard new missions, new capabilities will come out in best practice, and regional use cases. So if you have some uh, near real time uh, use case, uh, maybe contact Cristiano Lopez and you can come on board via a best practice that probably will be opened via towards end of this year. Could do maybe a bit too early uh, as I see it now. But there is uh, quite some funding available to, to integrate you in the, into this near real time platform. It means basically you can host your application uh, on a uh, platform where the data are available in near real time. In near real time, really, is we have seen some demonstrations where data have become available in 90 seconds to you uh, for being ingested in your algorithm. Uh, AI for food, skin of the land, how Patrick Griffiths, who is the technical officer, calls it, will come out in Q3, 600K. It is about data fusion between Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 to do really time series modeling and analytics and analysis with AI to do detection and prediction, hopefully, of change dynamics. So it's a new thing. We include, of course, methodology definition, experimental development, machine learning, and then we will see what, how we integrate this into the platform economy. Very important AI training data set. So the training data is really a, a golden asset that we should have in Europe to, to do AI. We should not be dependent on others here. Um, we are doing currently a study to define the specification. And always Patrick Griffiths will probably open an ITT for Q4. Um, we are still have to decide on the budget volume and if we immediately include also the service provision, but, oh, if you want to do that, at the end, you should have the will also to really provide an operational service uh, paid and funded by our customers. Of course, the network of resources will act as an anchor tenant to pay for your service. Very interesting and, and very strategic, uh, I think. Um, and again, on the platforms, of course, you have to uh, maintain some stability. Uh, so it's not always new projects, it's integration in existing environments, uh, AI extensions, possibly for digital twinners uh, to be seen, one is on the data tube. And we want that new partners can come on board here. So it will be an open best practice. You go to emits entity synergize for that. Philippe Munoz is the technical officers to select new partners in the Euro Data Cube to do the uh, artificial intelligence extension. Will come as planned for Q3, 500K. Similar things for the various tabs. Also here, we look for new partners who extend uh, a few tabs, the geohazard, food security, urban, and polar tab to AI capabilities. Um, again, under AMIT's entities, the primes of these various um, uh, tabs, so for Japanese, Terra Due, Food Security, it will be Vista, 
Urban Tap DLR and Polar Tap Polar View. So there will be best practices to onboard uh, new partners uh, to extend the platforms to AI capabilities. And this is it for the federated collaborative platforms. I'm looking forward to the bilaterals and I pass the ball to Anka. Um, <clears throat> Pierre Philippe will, will be first from this presentation, so if you can pass it. Okay. Please. So Pierre Philippe first. Let me find him. Pierre Philippe. The ball is with you. Okay, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Can you see the slides? Everything. Yes. Everything okay. Perfect. So, good morning, everybody. So, this is a new boys in town, AI for EO. The reason is that AI has been um, seen and perceived as a very uh, interesting technology with a high impact for our field. And the FILAP has been looking at different technologies and really identified this one because it's uh, scalable and a totally new paradigm, uh, learning from the data. So creating software for uh, problems that we don't fully understand by learning from the big data we have. And as you can see here, AI is basically everywhere in our life today. And what we uh, try to do at ESA and the field lab in particular is to move these technologies to the field of Earth observation. And in particular, computer vision, the one used in self-driving cars, but also autonomy of robots and natural language processing, etc. So in summary, what we try to do is to transform the petabyte of data into very relevant information by taking this kind of tensor view of the world, in particular with technologies like deep learning. So we are exploring the uh, strengths and weaknesses, and I will drop in the chat a report about what we have done so far in terms of use cases. And the uh, new dimension of it is also the, the predictive capability and the merge of the statistics with the models, uh, in particular in the context of the digital twin earth, where we will look at how really this in new interaction between the science, the machine learning, the data simulation, and the observing system itself um, could work, uh, trying to take inference to build emulator of models, etc. So ultimately, our goal is to build a kind of app store or to develop with your help a, a variety of use cases for different applications so that one day we can upload this kind of things maybe to a satellite. Uh, FISAT has been launched recently with an AI chip on board to just uh, demonstrate this possibility, making a proof of concept on how machine learning can be used real time on board. So we are uh, training uh, the schemes on Earth, we are doing use cases, and we can do inference also at the edge. So as you can see, there is a, a wide variety of application of uh, machine learning, from analytics to enhancing the capability of uh, sensors and models to parameterization. And um, to address part of these elements, uh, we are releasing a variety of ITTs, and my colleague Anka will also present some of them. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Of course, the field is huge and it can be really uh, disruptive. And we start with an ITT <clears throat> of 250K that will be released um, very soon uh, this year, which is about non-supervised learning because one of the main issue in this field is uh, we need uh, label data, we need annotation, we need quality control annotation and we critically lack this for uh, our data. So there are also techniques these days like unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning or auto-machine learning, creating the, the software automatically that uh, we would like to explore. And this ITT will do this in a variety of use cases. Um, I think three use cases. So we will get some handle on these new techniques like self-organizing map. 
Then it's followed by an ITT on a theory guided and explainable AI of 250K. And this one is really the holy grail is putting together the, the physics and the statistics, possibly directly coding the physics into the statistics or exploring way to fuse these uh, to work in synergy as a hybrid scheme. And uh, most of the attention there will be uh, looking at uh, radar data and the principle of the measurements of radar and try to ingest this into the machine learning. Then we will release an ITT on the European network of AI for EO labs. Uh, the idea is very simple. There are a lot of center of excellence uh, in member states and uh, national capabilities, thematic centers doing a uh, pure AI. Uh, AI is totally agnostic. Uh, many people come from mathematics, other people from uh, computer vision, etc. So what we want to do is to bring these talents uh, together and to expose them to the beautiful problems we have with Earth observation. So we want to build a variety of a mini lab, if you want, uh, within these uh, already existing entities to look uh, at Earth observation innovative application. And this can be with a specific themes like uh, certification or computer vision, et cetera. Then it will be followed by a, a, an ITT on the um, digital interface, uh, namely trying to transfer the capability of natural language processing to our field. So uh, metadata on Earth observation, ability to search by talking to an assistant, a bit like Alexa, if you want, and really moving uh, the capability of the new GPT-3 algorithm to our field, uh, trying to understand how the new generation of user can interact uh, with the data. Uh, we also want to reinforce the uh, capability of um, researcher, uh, invite people to ESA, to the free lab. Uh, we have already visiting professor and we need more. So we will do um, a specific call a bit a la living planet, uh, trying to really look at the AI uh, challenges also on the mathematics, the GANs, the cycle GANs, etc., the super resolution issue. So this will be documented there. Then we release an ITT on the software stack for DTE. So this is more a research activity. We want to understand how uh, the new generation of machine learning algorithm can be uh, working in harmony with uh, state-of-the-art modeling high res uh, to enable prediction, in particular through emulators, which are showing uh, increase of performance. Uh, and organizations like ECMWF are actively uh, looking at this kind of new technology. We have already demonstrated this for some retrieval scheme, and we want to learn more. Then comes the ITT on the training data set. Uh, Gunther already mentioned it. Uh, it's the new gold. Uh, you cannot do uh, uh, with supervised learning good training and deep training if you don't have a lot of labeled data set. This needs to be created, quality control. So this ITT will really look at this, how to define a kind of methodology and how to build these data sets, possibly leading ESA to create a, a new type of uh, data products apart from the level three and four. Uh, maybe looking at these training data set as a, as a product and there will be a lot of collaboration with the ground segment and the Calval and quality control team. And the last ITT will look on how to uh, maximize the value of the archive of Sentinel. Uh, we have talked a lot about super resolution. Uh, there is a risk uh, with these techniques. You can have what is called hallucination, which means fake um, fake uh, pattern coming out of the of the algorithm. So we want to look at the robustness of this and apply it to the archive to create a new product, also fusing optical and radar. And I'll stop there and pass the ball to my colleague Anka. Thank you. Go. Pure Good. Pure. Good. I'll stop sharing. Okay, should be working.
Yes, I think I can share my screen now. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope you can see my screen well and you can hear me. So good morning to um, everyone. My name is Anka Angela. I'm an Earth Observation Open Data Scientist uh, in the Data Applications Division. I will try to start my video as well. So today I will present to you the activities that we have in the pipeline for AI for EO, but focused on our system science. Um, through 2020, we've had a number of uh, consultations with the scientific community. Uh, some of these consultations took part, uh, took place during the fee week um, 2020. Uh, and on this slide, you can see uh, the reference to one of the side events that were organized during the fee week, which is called the AI for Understanding Processes in Intertwined Earth System Dynamics. Uh, this report, together with uh, the other reports from the fee week, are available on the website. And there were a number of um, takeaway messages that we we took home from from this uh, user consultation and science consultation. And uh, the main um, the main takeaway message, let's say, regarding AI for our science, is that AI is still in its infancy with regards to its adoption to um, our system science uh, problems and geoscience problems in general. So there were four main recommendations um, that you can find also in this report. One of them was that our system science needs to be equipped against naive applications of artificial intelligence methods. And this is strongly linked to interpretability and explainable AI. Uh, a second one is that AI can, be, uh, can, can raise a lot of opportunities if it is used jointly with traditional methods in our system science so that we can learn from AI what we cannot learn or do not know from first principles. And this opens the door for um, advances in methods such as hybrid modeling. Causal inference from Earth observations is another recommendation and another key uh, point where we can um, put more focus uh, during this year. And finally, exploring AI and its potential to enhance Earth observation-based products but moving, let's say, away from the typical um, data problems that we encounter in computer vision. So for this, uh, with this in mind and taking into consideration these recommendations, uh, there are a number of uh, ITTs that we are preparing. And this is a summary of the, of the main activities that we have in the pipeline. We have um, an AI for science uh, call that, is, um, that will be launched very soon. Uh, an extension of the Earth System Data Lab, um, an um, ITT that is um, that will be developed in the framework of the Climate Adaptation Natural Disasters flagship um, that uh, you saw presented earlier during the um, scientific activities presentation, and finally um, an activity on education. So regarding the AI for Science uh, call for proposals, this um, is a call that is uh, derived directly from the recommendations of the fee week, from the community recommendations. It is a call that will have um, its focus on three main um, topics. The first one is related to um, time series. So looking at uh, the development of AI methods and algorithms for learning from incomplete and sparse multivariate and multi-temporal observations. The whole call has a very strong focus on um, extreme events and is a direct contribution to the, to the um, climate adaptation and natural disasters flagship. The second um, direction or the second focus is on using Earth observation data um, uh, is using us observation data driven or developing data driven um, methods and applications for earth process process description so here the the aim is to develop um, AI based approaches to try to um, exploit in synergy um, heterogeneous earth observation data um, and products and the scope is to try to reveal those latent physical variables that we cannot directly observe or measure uh, from the current remote sensing techniques. And finally, um, a third component is related to the, let's say, social or anthropic 
um, connections uh, and interactions with ecosystems. So it is called AI for interactions between social and ecological systems. And here we look at developing methods to learn and characterize those complex interactions and feedbacks across physics, biochemistry, and ecosystem functioning while accounting for uh, human interactions. So there will be three um, different projects uh, funded, each of them of around 400,000K. Um, the second uh, ITT um, is the Deep Earth System Data Lab. So it is an evolution of the Earth System Data Lab, considered as, let's say, um, one of, of the core elements um, potentially contributing also to the digital twin earth. Um, it's, the aim here is to facilitate discovery and access to the already comprehensive collection of earth system variables, but to expand the data offering, um, especially taking into account the needs that come from the ESA science clusters that you also saw presented earlier. Uh, there is a strong collaborative component in this ITT, so the, whole, the, the goal is to permit collaborative design and development of AI workflows, including data and model evaluation and bench benchmarking and other um, functionalities or capabilities such as dealing with model versioning and everything in a collaborative environment. And third, uh, to allow for a seamless visualization and advanced visualization for the results of the um, of the workflows that are being run on the Earth System Data Lab, as well as publishing and dissemination of these results, so to to be used also as an interface for communication of our results. And the budget here is around one million euro, and the ITT is planned to be issued in the second quarter. Um, a third um, ITT is related to the Climate Adaptation Natural Disasters flagship. Uh, it is focused on hydroclimatic extremes, and this activity looks at using AI uh, to, to help us explore uh, multi-mission, multivariate or observation data sets and products to look at problems related to the detection and attribution of extreme events. These include heat waves, droughts, extreme pre precipitation and uh, the associated hazards um, such as fires or floods. Here we'll look at the most vulnerable um, ecosystems and regions, but and the focus is, let's say, starting from Europe, but with potential to go globally. Uh, the budget here is around 1 million euro and uh, it's planned to be issued in 2021. And just to mention that this has, uh, again, um, the, it's, it focuses again um, as, let's say, using the precursor uh, activity that was uh, presented just a, a few slides before in the AI for Science call. Uh, it looks at uh, how AI can be used to understand these um, very rare events. So we're, we're hoping to get some, um, to build, let's say, the theoretical framework and to, to advance on the theory with the first call and here to um, try to be more applicative. Finally, the um, educational component is an Earth Observation for Computer Scientists course. And here the, the focus is to, or the aim is to introduce the most common and specific challenges in our observation in geosciences and our system science to AI practitioners and data scientists. So looking at those specific problems through the development cycle of a data science project from an Earth observation perspective and addressing the typical problems that a data scientist might encounter when dealing with Earth observation data and geospatial data. Uh, you can see here some example topics going from the data collection and preparation to how to deal with spatial temporal problems, geospatial analysis, and what are the most common tools and approaches. And the, but the budget for this is uh, 150K with uh, planned uh, issue ITT on the fourth quarter of 2021. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think I have to pass the ball now to Gordon. Yeah, thanks, Anka. 
Okay, I think I've got it. Okay, it's me again. Have I shared the right thing? Can you see the slides in presenter mode? Yes. Yep. Okay, so the next 10 minutes, uh, just um, some uh, points about the the new permanently open call. Um, this the, the, the whole concept of the permanently open call was uh, uh, came about as a result of discussion with uh, member states going into the um, the 2016 ministerial uh, conference. We said we would uh, spend 10% of the um, the exploitation or the block for uh, money as um, uh, have that aside as um, the cost of contracts in the uh, for, for the permanently open call. The idea was rather than have everything defined by our work plan. Um, what this does is it provides an opportunity for uh, industry, universities, uh, whoever, um, to propose new activities and really, you know, it's a way of uh, trying out new things, if you like, without having to have it in, um, suggested by delegations incorporated into our work plan and then, you know, 12 months later we get a tender out. Uh, so it's really a rapid way of um, you know, verifying a, a proof of concept and addressing uh, emerging opportunities. Uh, we're really, um, if you look at the um, the assessment approach we've we've adopted, we're really trying to prioritise uh, innovative ideas that's responding to uh, emerging opportunities. And as you'll see later, a lot of the proposals uh, really are uh, responding to, uh, to to that requirement. Um, what we've done, uh, going from the last one to this one, we've really simplified. So the whole thing is, is meant to be as, as simple as possible. In particular, um, we have a template uh, against which you can uh, you, know, you fill in the template. That's that's what the proposal is. Um, so that's meant to basically minimise the administrative effort uh, on behalf of bidders. It's been further simplified. So I mean, the whole a lot of the PSS form requirements, for example, uh, are further simplified. So you can really focus on um technical development issues in 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 the proposal explanation um we're still trying for a faster turnaround from evaluation to negotiation um that's part of all of our objectives for this year and we know it's been a bit slow uh, over the last 12 months we've um we've implemented a number of measures uh, to address that and in terms of um uh, size and duration we're we're, look, we're still looking at uh, a maximum contract spend of 150,000 euro per contract and a duration of 12 months the idea being that's enough money to do uh, a sufficient uh, verification without going into too much detail if it's something that's more complex or lasts longer then it really should be something that is part of the conventional work plan and isn't doesn't need to be uh, addressed by the um uh, the permanently open call in terms of the um uh, whoops sorry uh, in, in, in terms of the statistics, I mean, uh, we have placed uh, 109 con from from the permanent open call so far. Uh, we've placed 109 contracts. I mean, that that is quite a uh, we, we, we believe that is quite an achievement um, by the technical officers and the contracts office in the time available. Um, you know, placing 109 contracts in parallel to all the other contracts we've been placed, and we reviewed 351 proposals as of uh, the end of last year. Uh, you can see we're also getting um, uh, proposal in more or less uh, all of the lines and um, with more or less uh, a constant um, success rate in, in, in each of these and also a constant, uh, more or less a constant rate in terms of a uh, number of proposals uh, being submitted. So the interest is there and we hope to uh, maintain that as we go into the um, the future EO. Uh, permanently open call, which we've already had the first deadline, and the second one is um, later this month. In terms of the innovation, just I mean, your bidders are taking this seriously. When we're seeing um, a very large number or a very large percentage of the proposals are either new activities that we've not seen in uh, Earth Observation uh, tenders before, or else new bidders that we've not really worked with uh, before. So we get a lot of. Um, startups spin-offs people that have been in maybe in a in a sector but haven't been using earth observation etc so and in some cases we, we get a combination of new bidders and new activities as well and i think one thing 
to point out, let's just emphasize the success rate between bidders we've never heard of before, uh, the established bidders that we've been working with for hundreds of years, there's not really any change. So we attribute that to the fact that there's a um, that there is a template that's making you know it's it's leveling the playing field. Uh, so we're uh, we're quite happy about that as well. Um, so uh, like I say, yeah, the first um, we we opened this in um, uh, 2020 in October 2020. The first uh, submission deadline for the new one was uh, December 2020, and like I say, the future deadlines are March, July, and November. We're going down to um three submission deadlines per year instead of four um the justification for that was basically um or the original idea of, of the permanently open call was to have proposals evaluated at the point that they came in the idea being you have an opportunity it's there for a set time you want to respond to it we should be able to uh, assess uh, assess what's happening uh, pretty quickly uh, what we were seeing was apart from one or two proposals uh, and, and in in uh, over the whole three years basically all of the proposals came in at the um, at the submission deadline uh, so we get nothing and then a big wave of uh, um, somewhere between 30 and 50 proposals uh, that we had to turn around so based on that we agreed with program board uh, that we would go down from four deadlines to three given that bidders are driven by the deadline not by uh, any uh, timing uh, that is unavoidably associated with uh, whatever opportunity you're you're um, you're proposing, uh, the scope of the call now covers um, block four of uh, future EO. Uh, so that's scientific data exploitation EO for resilient society, AI for EO, the regional initiatives, and EO uh, for uh, civil security. Um, however, um, what I would say is, if you look at what was in the old call and what's in the new call, if you want to do something in science exploitation, whoops, that's gone too fast. Sorry, let me just go back. Um, so in terms of if you want to do, if you're looking at something in science exploitation, um, what you wanted to do under science exploitation is entirely doable under the science grand challenges, the regional initiatives, AI for EO, or EO for Africa. It's going to be very difficult to find something that you would have done in science exploitation that you can't do under one of these lines. Similarly, um, uh, if, if you want to do something that was originally under industry growth um, or public sector applications or um, the evolving shared technical platform capabilities, uh, it's pretty much all the same. I mean, there's uh, a lot of scope to do things under EO for resilience, under the regional initiatives, under AI for EO or under EO for security. I think it's going to be pretty hard to find anything in industry growth, public sector applications or uh, the evolving shared technical platform capabilities and building network of resources that isn't under one of these lines. Okay, and that's just uh, what I'm uh, emphasizing with these arrows. Um, if you do have a problem, uh, put something in uh, the request for um, uh, clarification and we'll, we'll, we'll try and sort it out. But I really think, you know, we've thought about this quite a lot and it's pretty difficult to find something that isn't in there, uh, at least for the scope of the um, apparently open call. Other things you should be considering. Um, what we see sometimes, um, it, you know, th this is based on uh, lessons learned from having evaluated a very large number of proposals. Firstly, I think you need to explain very clearly what you, you want to develop as, um, uh, as, as the, um, the activity you're proposing. Um, and what are the target performance requirements that you want to be achieved and why? Without these things, it's very difficult for us to understand if your technical methodology actually addresses something um, that it, it is linked to the, the opportunity you've identified. And you know, in, in some extreme cases, it can be very difficult for us to understand really what uh, a bidder is wanting to do. So, I mean, you know, please make sure it's very clear what's being developed and target performance requirements to be achieved and why. Um, the next point. Um, in, I mean, th these are all elements in, in the template. Be very clear. What are the innovations you're proposing? Okay, the, 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 it's the weighting on criterion two, which is um, the innovative content, the expected impact, and the discussion of problem areas in in, in the ITT. It's very high. I think it's for, it's forty percent if you look at the uh, um, the special terms and conditions. So if you don't explain the innovations um, clearly with respect to the current state of the art, then you know, the, the getting, a, you know, getting your proposal selected uh, is still possible, but it's, it's an uphill battle. 
Um, similarly, be very clear what are the impacts resulting from your proposed development? What's the what's the um, the improvement over the current state of the art? Why is this relevant? Why is it important? Uh, why is it worth doing? Really you know, make sure that it's it's, it's very clear. Um, and I think the last point about this, this other criteria, the discussion of the problem areas, given that you're proposing something innovative, given that it's, it's going to be making an impact, there must be technical difficulties associated with achieving that. So, the I mean, the discussion of the problem areas isn't about the project manager might leave or we might all have a fight or, uh, or whatever. It's about the technical difficulties inherent in what you're trying to do and what are you proposing to address these technical difficulties, okay, and then that should all be visible in the um, in, in, in the technical work plan. If you're not clear on that, then again, it's very difficult for us to understand uh, if what you're doing uh, is innovative. And um, sorry, I just realised I was blocking the camera, uh, and and whether that makes sense. Uh, and last point there is, like, say, what are the the, the technical difficulties you're proposing? No, sorry, the technical developments um, you're proposing to execute, and how do you ensure that um, these developments are done in a way? that um, you're meeting the target performance levels that you've stated at the beginning of your proposal. If you can explain all that to somebody in your organisation that's not been involved uh, in the proposal writing, and they can explain that back to you in a way that sounds like um, you'd give that person money, then I think you have the basis of a very, very good proposal. If, they're, if there's somebody else isn't able to explain that, then I think you want to re visit, revisit uh, the template and think about either what you're doing or how you're explaining it to us in, in, in the template. Okay, two last points uh, on this. Um, for a lot of the lines, so resilience, regional initiatives, uh, EO for security in particular, um, you need, uh, it, or it's better if you have letters of support from users, right? They're, I mean, it's not that we throw the proposal away if you don't have them, but um, it, you know, it, it demonstrates better engagement with the target community you're addressing uh, and you, know, you, you get better marks for it. And the last thing we get as a clarification request every so often is do we need uh, or do you need letters of support from your national delegation? Um, you don't for, for anything that we do in, uh, in future EO. Um, the reason being that the delegates have already approved our work plan uh, for, for, for the year. So. Um, the need for additional support for individual bidders isn't uh, is, isn't considered necessary. So um, don't waste time trying to get uh, or trying to get letters of support, and don't annoy the delegations because they're all very busy anyway. So uh, you don't need these, but you know, for the lines I I I'd mentioned, please you know try and get the the, the letters of support from users. It uh, it really puts your proposal in a a much stronger context with the right sort of letter. And that's it for the permanently open call. I shall stop and try and stop. And stop sharing and hand back to Eve Louis. Do I hand back to you? Yes, yes, uh, please. So thanks very much, Gordon. I think we, we are now uh, a bit ahead of schedule, which is good. Uh, means we we are in the q a uh, sessions so if you have any question uh, you would like to to ask us uh, now please, please go on and we will try with um, all the presenters and uh, and even some uh, some colleagues to to reply to to them so the floor is really uh, open to to you So we are just watching the, the chat. I don't see uh, anybody coming in. So I, I leave a bit of time, so you have time to, to prepare your, your questions. I can just... Uh, uh, mention, I think something we we said. So the um, uh, the video recording is uh, ah. what there is a question. Oh, it's coming in. Uh, first question is uh, Gordon is a technical difficulty also driver for grand science. I think we we need to 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 give. Uh, I would pass this one to to Diego. I think. Huh? 
Suppose you are referring to the open call. Diego, you want to take this one? Yes, I can take this one. So on the on the science uh, aspects of the open call, we are addressing in practical terms all the different elements associated with the scientific development. So that goes from the development of novel uh, novel capabilities. That means new methods, new algorithms, new products, etc. To the use of those products to solve, uh, let's say, uh, science questions or uh, knowledge gaps in our system science. So this is the 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 wide uh, the wide uh, opportunities that we have in the context of science. So if you are if the question is about the technical difficulty, the uh, what we are the driver has to be uh, that you have a gap today in terms of observation. So you have a gap today in terms of knowledge. So this is in practical terms the. The main driver, scientific excellence to address things that today we cannot do. That means so a new observation or addressing a particular problem that today cannot be solved. Thank you, Diego. I have an, another question on the open call uh, to Gordon. Uh, what does a bit slow on evaluation you think proposal mean with reference to the open core? Uh, well, we were looking for a turnaround of um, uh, about two months. Uh, we haven't made that, so um, we're, we're, we're trying to speed that. It takes, I mean, we, there's a limiting factor in doing an effective evaluation of quite a large number of proposals um, every uh, for, for every submission date. Um, so it, 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 we can't go faster than about, uh, it's going to be difficult to go from submission to uh, notification to success faster than about two months, I think. We'll try and get that down, but uh, um, and we're working to get that down as, as, as much as possible. Okay. We didn't meet I, that in some cases under the, the old one. I have another one. Um, can a proposal for the open call address multiple key issues, e.g. both um, AI technical component and societal problem in Africa? That's a question. Sorry, can you say that again? Can a proposal for the open call address multiple key issues or multi multiple topics? Yeah, Is but I mean... Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, there'll be one, presumably there'll be one that uh, is, is more important. To be honest, I mean, if you're in one topic and it's relevant to the other, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's the same tender evaluation board for you know, it's a single tender evaluation board covering you know all of all of the topics. So um, if it's relevant for something else, then you know we'll look at it under something else as well. So um, it's not like if you put something in for science grand challenges, then that's it. You've had your chance, and we're not going to consider it for um, regional initiatives or whatever. It's I mean it's 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 it, they're, they're all there in the same pot. Okay. There is another question on the open call. Uh, are, the, are the topics that relate to the CAP, Common Agriculture Policy, also within scope? For example, uh, when linked to resilience or AI for you. Thank you. That's okay. Yeah, like I say, I mean, it's most of the developments you're doing are going to be uh, linkable to, um, uh, you know, anything to do with a policy like CAP is is uh, addressable. You know, it, it's linked to. Um, all four of the these elements I pointed to in some way you you, you decide how, how it's uh, how that linkage is, is um, okay which is the most important one to you I have another question on the open call uh, no. <laughs> sorry Gordon I could answer that one but I leave you answering is there an overview of the projects that have uh, already been selected there Yes, they're on the EO Science for Society uh, website. There's a tag uh, that's permanently open call that you can look to uh, uh, select all the projects that have been placed so far, or the, all the contracts that have been done so far. Okay. Um, now I have a question for, um, I guess it's for uh, Anka. Uh, I have a lot of questions. I think it's scrolling too, too fast. Uh, with respect to the AI for AO MOOC, does it have a coordination interaction with university in its member states? And if so, 
is there any involvement of that group with the MOOC initiatives? Um, certainly, when defining the topics and the course materials of the curricula, um, the academic community will be will be involved. Okay. I have a question for Diego. Uh, can we elaborate a bit on the, the research part of the future EO core? Is it a requirement to include some development as well, or just tested EO algorithms that are needed for the application? Diego? Well, that depends a lot of the type of the ITTs that we are doing. If it's related, uh, I don't understand what the question is. If, if the question is related to the, to the open core, uh, it, it's related to the research part of Futurio. Okay, so if it's implanting alternatives associated to the type of projects that we have, in the, uh, that is defined by the ITT itself. So you could have dedicated, very focused activities to develop a particular uh, method or algorithm. And you will have also large activities that we are trying to provide the best possible reconstruction of the Antarctic hydrological system. So obviously you will have activities focused in the order of 250, 300K and the others of 1 million, 1 million and a half. So that depends very much on the scope that we are uh, putting in that particular ITT. But you will have opportunities for develop a specific methods and algorithms where the main target is to actually develop and validate the algorithm and try to have a, a new product. And then you will have more articulated ITTs, but we are trying to bring data together, the observation in C2 models to have this uh, type of uh, reconstruction activities that I've been uh, talking about before. Okay, uh, the next question is about um, how is the open core in AI4AO related to uh, the relevant tenders we have uh, placed uh, by ITT? Uh, I think I, I, I can really answer, or you take it, Diego, as you want. It's just to explain the difference between the open core and, and the uh, ITTs approved in the work plan. Um, yes, so... Um in practical terms, the open call is an opportunity for the community to provide ideas. Okay? Uh, those opportunities will actually result in progress in science, in progress in applications, in progress in the way we can do things. For sure, for sure, we take into account the results of these projects to prepare new entities in the future. So if we see that third term uh, capabilities are now available that we are able to observe things that before we were not able to observe, if we are able to address problems that we will not, that we were not able to address in the past, certainly we take those things into account to prepare ITTs in the future. So there is always, uh, let's say, uh, a channel, if you wish, between the knowledge that we create through the open calls and the ITTs that you can see, the bigger ITTs. This is, this is clear. Okay, I have uh, one more question for Diego. Uh, can I ask Diego about the detail of the Polar Gap ITT? Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. Yes, so um, as I mentioned before, in the area of polar research, we have uh, launched this, uh, this a polar science cluster that is collecting several projects, uh, all addressing different aspects of polar research. Some of them are addressing a specific product, so they are addressing sometimes process understanding. And together with our colleagues in Brussels of the European Commission, we had last year this large event, uh, the European Polar Science Week. And we had a full week discussing about uh, what are the next challenges in polar research, what we can do, etc. And we have several sessions uh, providing recommendations. So in this new ITT, we will address only those, a son of those, okay? Will be uh, between 1.5 and 2 million. And the topics that we have on the table right now are uh, something related to CIs and in particular something together with WMO to have a better CIs characterization and in particular focusing on the intercomparison exercise. We can look also at glaciers, and in particular, multi-mission glacier mass balance. And we are also addressing the uh, one of the uh, 
activities that we have also together with NASA, which is focused on Arctic uh, permafrost and methane emissions. And there are a number of other topics that we are discussing if uh, could be addressed in this call or maybe later. One is uh, freshwater fluxes in the Arctic, and there are several others. So we don't have enough funding to address everything, but we will start activities, especially some areas that uh, today in the activities of the polar cluster, we are not covering that much. So we will reinforce uh, those, those particular uh, topics. Thank you, Diego. I have a question for Giuseppe. Um, it's about how could end user public sector bodies find relevant partners? I think I okay, can. Thanks. Yes, go ahead. Thanks for the question. Um, indeed. Um, so, normally, the um, primary stakeholders, so the public sector bodies, are already well identified and the dialogue with them is already engaged by ESA. And this is done with the user consulta consultation workshop. During this process, it is made sure that the EO value proposition is well established with these uh, public sector bodies and that uh, we capture all the specific recommendations they may have with respect to the prob problem and problems they are addressing. So ESA with, ensures uh, its neutral, let's say, super partis uh, role by establishing this, this link with the public sector bodies and then um, launches the ITT. Therefore, during the uh, bidding period, then the tenderers will be able to basically already respond to uh, the well-identified um, issues that uh, ESA has captured. Okay, thank you. I think the next question is for Gordon. Uh, uh, what are the rules for resubmitting proposal rejected in previous calls? I suppose it's referring to the open. Um, there aren't any rules. I mean, originally we thought um, people wouldn't want to do that, but uh, increasingly we're seeing um, that happening. What I would uh, recommend is you make sure you get a debrief before you um, from ESA before you resubmit because I mean if it's if there's a fundamental element like you know the core um, the core idea is you know it's, it's been done 15 times before then there's maybe not that much point uh, in, in submitting it unless you're looking at something that hasn't really been thought of in, in some aspects haven't really been thought of so uh, make sure you get a debrief um, before thinking about uh, the, the, the resubmission, otherwise, you know, it's uh, yeah, you're not making the best use of uh, um, uh, of the uh, the facilities we have. Even if you're not intending to resubmit, I would still suggest ask for a debrief. I mean, if you don't ask for a debrief, we're not going to give you one. We don't phone you up and uh, tell you why your proposal isn't uh, isn't rejected. But if it is rejected, I would say always, always, always ask for a debrief and whatever tender you're doing, because. Uh, um it's you know it, it's helpful it's always helpful for um how, how you then take that experience into future tenders okay thanks i have a question for gunther uh what kind of project can apply for a network of resource funding and how uh, does it have to be a, an isa project or other scientific projects are eligible so, um, so just to clarify, we are, the NOAA is not funding projects, the NOAA is sponsoring projects. So we give the projects a voucher that they can use the resource to or the platform resources. So you get this voucher that you can pay for these resources, We're not funding directly the projects. Now for the resource tier, so if you want to just buy computing resources, uh, this is only for ESA projects. So if you have an ITT for an ESA project, you can rely on using that. Um, on the platform services tier, instead, we also sponsor other scientific projects. So for the platform services tier, your data cube, TAPS, uh, Elite, BSD, there are several offerings. Um, uh, we also uh, sponsor non-ESA projects. Thanks, Gunther. The next one is again for uh, Gordon. Uh, it's about small satellite regarding expanded uptake for small satellite data. Is the ITT covering just mission analysis or even prototyping? Uh, 
Um, cool. Okay. Um, thank. I think. Okay. Thanks for that question. Um, the the idea is um, basically how do we work with the small satellite um, operators? Okay. So we're expecting um, this the system to uh, or to already have some platforms in space. You might not be at full capacity, but you should have uh, some data there. And I mean, the philosophy there was how do we work with small satellites without coming along imposing ECSS type approaches and things. So it's um, for these small satellites, there's private sector investment, there's a business plan. We don't want to get, you know, that, that, that's all great. We want to look at how can we expand um, the uptake of, of the data beyond what was foreseen in the original business plan. Um, so that means, you know, how, if you're coming along with um, a new data source is it isn't already available or is complementary, um uh, to sentinels or or whatever um either you know, it's, it's improving the updates or um different uh, overpass times or whatever so increased persistence uh, so you know given that a lot of the small satellite capabilities are um different to the, the baseline capabilities we're saying how can we um how can we put you in front of um users that would have fairly stringent operation requirements and have a framework in which uh, you can try these things out with real data, with the real system, uh, in realistic scenarios with, with these users that can hopefully end up with um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, procurement of, of uh, data beyond the customers you're, uh, you're originally targeting with your uh, with your system so it's, it's we're not looking at system studies we're not looking at uh, i mean this isn't paper it's all about the exploitation of uh these new systems and that's why we've been delayed because there was such a, a launch delay with a lot of the small satellites okay uh the next question is um from uh, I, I i take maybe the last one first it has moved moved up thank you for uh, an excellent information day will the slides be made available yes they would be made available uh, i can i can uh, offer within today including the, the video should be uh, they are being mounted in parallel of the uh, of the info day so should be available uh, shortly so you will have both the uh, silent slide and all the presentation uh, as it has been recorded and and, uh, and mounted um, the question before uh, was, are you planning to set up a better system for notification updates so we can stay up to date on, uh, on the O4 Society events and opportunities? I think the, um, the answer is twofold. I think the uh, website is uh, being kept up to date and it includes also um, uh, all the project information, the ongoing project information is linked actually uh, with the content of SAP. So it's also a place where you can find all the events which are planned and uh, the partners, eventual partners in your domain of expertise and things like that. Uh, yes, so we can always improve uh, the system for notification uh, uh, using uh, latest technology and within the constraint of the uh, uh, GDPR. That's uh, for us from CAT. Um, the next one, uh, does ESA provide support to foster DS usage? I think this is one um, uh, for Gunther. Uh, can I apply for funding for paying uh, for using DS resources? Uh, are there any discount uh, for DS users funded by ISAS? Thank you. So can you can you take this uh, question, Gunther? Yeah, of course we provide support to foster DS usage in, in two ways. So for the ESA projects, um, you can apply, of course, to the model and we will pay this in full. Um, the, the DS resources. Um, but in addition, uh, all the platform services are also using the DS resources. So if you use the platform services for your activity, you indirectly use the DS resources and this we fund also uh, for non-ESA projects. So you can uh, apply for that. Um, we have some discounts for research projects from, from the DS is a network of resources. Uh, but of course, these discounts would not be applicable if you use the DSS and pay the DSS directly. But let's say most of them have actually research discounts. Okay. Um, there is one for um, for Gordon. 
for when is the EU for security environmental crime crime uh, against humanity ITT plan? Uh, we're looking at uh, quarter two. We have um, a, a restricted workshop with uh, uh, some of the core stakeholders that are involved in that. That means that um, I mean they'll hopefully, I mean, some of them are sort of agreed already, it will be coming out of the workshop, that they will agree to work with whoever wins. Okay, so that means for some of the core guys, you don't need to go off getting letters of support, you can focus on um, some of the other guys that you might have uh, better contact with. Once we've had that workshop, we'll be in a, a position to uh, release the ITT. So it's um, um, before summer is the target. Okay. Uh, the next one is about, it's a very specific question. I think it's the, um, uh, somebody proposing an ID uh, related to the use of uh, early warning with uh, Sentinel in SAR. Can it be a topic for the open call? We, I cannot give an answer uh, to, to this question, but I think you should follow the recommendation presented to, uh, uh, by Gordon and antique all the boxes uh, regarding the innovative nature of the proposal, and then you will have uh, uh, your answer, I would say, follows the guidelines provided by, by Gordon. Um, the last, ne next one, I think I could um, uh, pass it to, to Giuseppe. Uh, for the different calls, what is the potential to collaborate with uh, source partners, uh, non EU? I guess it's about uh, users. I think I, I leave it to, to Giuseppe uh, to answer. Yeah. So um, in, in this specific case, I mean, either the partner is already identified within the call uh, to, again, as I mentioned, to ensure the uh, ESA neutrality aspect, but for sure, additional possible collaboration are certainly much uh, welcome. Um, and uh, here is uh, when, when I read partners are, you know, it, it, it depends on, whether the party is an institutional partner and not a, a commercial partner, which is, uh, you know, a non, if let's say coming from non-ESA um, member states, in that case, we would have uh, an issue with that uh, aspect um, in terms of uh, geo return, of course. Uh, but institutional public partners uh, are certainly welcome, especially with respect to showing the uh, the uptake of the results coming from the um, uh, EO products and services. We have reached uh, the bottom, uh, the last question in the um, uh, in the chat. So I'm um, please go ahead if you have. Uh, we, we have still a bit of time if you want us to cover some. I have noticed that we I could not really cover 100% of the question which were planned, but we, we took note of them and we can come back uh, to them in a way or another. That should be uh, should be done. They are being collected. So any additional question to to, uh, to us? I hope you are, you are. Um, all clear on the organization of the, the B2B uh, meetings. So we, we of course, see, um, as I mentioned in, in the chat uh, earlier this morning, uh, the people who, who have pre-booked have priority. Uh, they will confirm their, their slot by, uh, by six o'clock uh, tonight. And for those who, who are still in, uh, in the waiting list, we will uh, try to allocate you the, um, the available slot. And but last but not least, we can uh, also uh, uh, get in contact. Uh, you can con still contact us, of course, after the uh, this week of uh, AO information days. I have two more questions. Since uh, maybe I start with this one. Uh, does Living Planet Fellowship have a deadline every year? This is for uh, Diego. Yes. Uh, so we have a call. Uh, every year, this is the plan. So the next one, the next call will be probably by the end of the year to have more or less the deadline in the early 22. So more or less we are trying to have every year. Yes. Okay, the next question is about the um, uh, open call and the message on the letters of support. Uh, Gordon seems to suggest that they are still at full, even not requested. Uh, 
Is that correct? Sorry? Uh, you can read it. It's about the letters of support. The question, I can read the question again. Sorry. Yes, please. For the open call, the template says that the letter of support are not requested for some of the teams. Yes, for so, so for some of the teams, it doesn't make sense. Um, so it's not required. For the others, it is required. Yes. So go by what it says in the cover letter. That's what I was trying to explain as well. Okay. Uh, the next question is the, uh, it's a very good one uh, uh, from Nino. For the bilateral meetings, is it possible to have other people uh, than the user who requested the meeting, join the meeting? The answer is a big yes, yeah. Uh, actually, I, I have um, myself I'm struggling to, because I have people from the same company, uh, some being pre-booked pre and some not being pre-booked. So uh, as far as feasible, if you can join together, that's, uh, that's of course, of course more, more efficient. Eh? Um, Uh, hello, is it possible to get an access to Brella platform for peer-to-peer -peer networking? I think uh, this is, uh, you, you, we might send you a, an email or you should have received it from Doris. I think we, we can email you uh, this afternoon. But the books, there are only a few slots uh, available, with, but you need to check it every day. Um, next question is for, uh, Gunther, is platform support of a uh, network of resources applicable also for uh, UP42 and one Atlas platform? Um, yes, in, uh, in principle, yes. I know most of them are in the onboarding. Um, but if you have an urgent need for a platform that you want to use and it's not yet in network of resources, we can also proceed to an ad hoc onboarding of this of this resource. So, in principle, any European platform provider that you would like to use, um, you you can apply. Okay. Uh, the next question is a very important one. Um, is there or are there opportunity for PEX country to participate in some of the projects? I think Gordon is a, is the best person to. Uh, to guide you there. Okay. Um, in terms of the tenders, um, you know the 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 the, the cover the the, um, the ITT on Emmet shows which are the countries um, that are eligible to bid. Um, what I would suggest, I mean, in in some areas like the Baltic, some of the PEX countries are uh, we're working with the delegations to have coordinated uh, activities, putting together PEX funding and um, future EO or EOEP funding, and I think that should be possible in uh, for other countries as well. So it would need to it would need to involve the relevant national delegation, and we would need to um, uh, structure the collaboration through um, the PEX funding in the in the countries of interest. But yes, that's clearly something that is very interesting for us, uh, so that we can accelerate the connection between organizations in PEX countries and organizations in full member state countries so that you're in a position to uh, be in consortia uh, as and when the country becomes either an associate member state or a full member state. Uh, the next one, I think I can pass it to uh, Giuseppe. Um, it's uh, our innovative projects. I can read it like this use case addressing SDG related to monitoring also in scope of the permanently uh, open call. Giuseppe? Yeah, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So we can, uh, as, as also Diego had mentioned in his presentation, we, um, we connect the dots across the, uh, the ITT specifically open for the SDGs and also other uh, open calls that are addressing potentially any of the SDG targets or indicators. So this is uh, certainly also um, foreseeable indeed. I confirm this. Uh, the next one is also for you, um, Giuseppe. Uh, how can institutions and companies from Africa participate in uh, EO for Africa? Okay, so this is from Michael Buck. Yeah, 
we are indeed um, thanks also the African um, Union we are indeed making the best in terms of uh, um, let's say communication uh, in uh, in Africa and uh, with the University of Twente we are making sure that uh, from the communication perspective uh, we reach out to make sure that any of the future research um, uh, proposals will have this sort of binom time of approach with uh, uh, LM, uh, in institutions from uh, Europe and in Africa as well. The next one is for uh, Gordon. Uh, is the ITT small satellite verification for security stakeholders only open to European small satellite or can American providers also join with the European partner? Gordon. Uh, I mean, we were primarily targeting uh, European satellites. Um, if it's for non-Europeans, we'd have to um, we, we, we'd have to look at it. I mean, you know, we work we work on geographic return, so we were expecting um, to uh, to stimulate uh, developments in the in the member states. Yeah, that's a very clear answer. I've reached uh, the bottom of the list I can see. So with a very dynamic uh, question answer, answer session. Is there any additional uh, burning question you would like to ask us uh, now? If I just wait uh, one or two minutes, and then uh, otherwise we will be uh, we'll close the session. I think we spend, which is positive, we spend a lot of time uh, uh, this, in this question answer session, which is very positive. Sorry, so I'm I'm just waiting a second. If you have any last minute question, we will. Okay, so um, I propose we, we close uh, the session now. I would like to thank you uh, all for, for having joined this, uh, this morning session. And uh, I would like to thank all participants. I think I've seen a, a peak around 300. We have got 500 people registered. Uh, we have seen also the um, the number of B2B which are being uh, organized. Um, so um, we are really looking forward to, to talk to you uh, uh, during uh, this week and of course uh, at any time uh, as you wish. I would like to thank really all my, my colleagues uh, for, for their preparation and a nice presentation. Uh, I need also to thank really the um, the organizing team uh, with uh, Doris under the lead of Doris with uh, Sabrina and uh, and other people from the, the support team we, we, which are making it possible. Um, I think you we 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 break now for um, for lunch and we uh, reconvene uh, uh, just before uh, two o'clock for for the last uh, uh, two continued pre presentation and session answer and it's. We, the first one being on Global Development Assistance, uh, GDA, uh, at 14 to 14.30, and then uh, uh, on Incubed uh, from 14.30 to 1.500. The real closure of the meeting uh, will be, of course, at 3 o'clock. So um, look forward to, to you joining at uh, just before 2 for, for the continuation. Have a good lunch.